The story takes place at a small hotel where I worked at. My coworker had just finished up her eight hours and I was due to leave pretty soon. It was 10 p.m. on a weekday, so the only people working there were me and the dining lady who also cleans and does a few other odd jobs around the hotel. We were in low occupancy, so it was dead quiet. The lobby and the sitting area were really empty. Really my only comfort was the TV. It was an easy night, so at least I had that going for me. Then I get a call. The caller ID didn't display a nine-digit number like it usually does, but instead, it's the last four digits of the hotel's phone number, which does tend to happen if someone's calling from one of the phones in the hallway. Also, guest calls almost always come through the front desk phone designated for rooms, but at times, they end up being directed to the superset phones, and so the caller ID will show the last four digits of the hotel phone number. So, it wasn't out of the ordinary, just rare. So anyways, there I am enjoying the quietness, googling random shit to pass the time, and I pick up the phone and this guy answers. He sounds like he's in his 30s, maybe early 40s. He sounds really happy. He asks me how I was doing that night, which was really refreshing for a change. I engage, even though I honestly really wasn't in the mood. He laughs and jokes around before then asking if anyone's made a noise complaint. Um, not to my knowledge, I tell him, wondering in the back of my mind if I had heard anything that night. So it continues rather slowly because he's chuckling behind his words. I begin to hear someone else, a woman, in the background. So I think that's cute. This guy sounds like he's having a blast with his wife or something like that. They're probably in there getting turned as hell. Then he says, well, I was just calling to make sure because, you see, my mother-in-law is here with me and she can't stop laughing. I began to laugh a little. How nice was it for him to call out of the concern for the other guests? I hear her as he's speaking. She's a little loud, but not enough for it to penetrate the walls or anything. I tell him it's totally fine. No big deal, honestly. I expect him to say something out of relief and hang up, but he just continues. I don't remember exactly what he said, but much of it was just him reiterating. It's just that she's laughing so much and won't stop. I try to be as nice and understanding as I can and just insist that it's fine once again. Then he asks me, Do you know why she's laughing? Ugh, he wants to have a conversation now. I honestly couldn't care less why his mother-in-law was laughing, but I'm a front desk agent. We do more than check people in and out. Sometimes we have to entertain. So I ask, why? Why is she laughing? And then he starts laughing. He can't spit out his words fast enough because he's freaking laughing and I hear her too and I'm getting annoyed and slightly uncomfortable now. I wait another few seconds before he says it. Because I'm tickling her feet, that's why. Looking back now, I think to myself, why didn't I just hang up on the phone right then and there? There weren't words that I could use to respond to this guy, because who the hell would, right? I was already hungry and tired. Now I was hungry, tired, confused, and mildly offended. And like an idiot, instead of shutting him down, I just laughed and said, Um, okay? And the guy goes, Yeah, I'm tickling my mother-in-law's feet and she loves it. She can't stop laughing. For some reason, I just couldn't control the nervous spurts of laughter that were coming out of my mouth. I'm listening to this woman in the background who sounds like a broken record at this point. She's laughing uncontrollably while I'm crying internally. Oh yeah, he says. She really loves it and I like it too. He sort of stopped laughing at this point and his voice then took on a really serious tone. And can you guess? I still didn't hang up the damn phone. I think at that point I was just zoning out. The dude just continues to talk about how much he's enjoying this. Good for you. I tell him and I try to cut it off right there. Do you like your feet tickled? He asked me. Tickling my mother-in-law's feet makes me a little horny. I wish it was my wife but she's not here right now. 
And that's where I kind of blinked and realized that this guy didn't call because he was concerned about a noise complaint. He's rambling on about his mother-in-law's feet while I'm at the front desk simultaneously helping other guests, and I can't put down the phone because I just can't believe I'm in this situation. Then I get the thought in the back of my mind that the mother-in-law's laughing just a bit too much. She hadn't said anything throughout the entire phone call like stop it or quit it. Her laughs were all the same like they were on a freaking loop or something. Someone came to check in and I had to tell Feet Creep that I had to go. He sort of hesitated for a bit like he wanted me to stay and talk a bit longer. His voice trailed off and I still heard the lady laughing in the background. I took that as my cue to hang up. I closed the blinds in the lobby and kept my ass behind the desk unless my help was desperately needed elsewhere. The dude talking about him tickling his mother-in-law's feet wasn't the thing that really scared me. It was more of the fact that the feet creep's call came through the superset phone without his last name and room number displayed on the caller ID. So I mean, I didn't know who was calling or if they were even in house. That and because I'm pretty sure that the woman in the background was definitely a recording. It was really creepy. I have been a big fan of this channel for a long time. I had never had a story that made me think that it was worth sharing until recently. This is my first time posting something like this, but I felt like I should since it is something that will most likely stick with me forever. For context, I'm a male and I work at a gas station in the deep south, a part of Louisiana that most people have never even heard of. I'm talking about dirt roads with no name, thick trees that seem to swallow darkness, and you might be lucky enough to see a street light every other mile. The little gas station that I work at is located in the trifecta of all these elements. I, of course, work the overnight shifts. The gas station doesn't see much excitement. There are either the 10 customers that come in between the hours of 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., or the random possums that decide to make the trash cans outside their personal drum set, but I digress. The night started like any other night. Make sure that the coffee is fresh, check. Make sure all the snacks, cold drinks, and beer are properly stocked. Check. Now all that is left for me to do is, well, wait. I stood behind the counter, looking at inventory, listening to music, and just pacing around for the first couple of hours. You know the thing that people say, time flies? Yeah, that didn't apply to that shift. As I got bored, I decided to leave the register and check out the items on the shelf to, you know make sure nothing majestically sold itself. While I was on one of the aisles, I heard a man call out, Hey, y'all open? I turned around to see that I had two customers standing at the checkout. Now I should mention this gas station does not have that fancy system that makes the doors go ding when someone comes in. Top line security, right? So I was caught off guard that two customers had come in without my knowledge. I quickly walked up to the register and apologized for the wait. As we were making the usual conversation of, hey, how you doing, and man, it's dark out here in this area, the customer asked another question that is usually always asked, how long is it until I get to the city from here? I answered it with the same answer that seems to automatically live in my mind rent-free. Uh, it's a good couple hours from here, just go towards the lights. Corny, I know, but that's my thing. Anyway, after scanning the customer's items, which literally was a candy bar and a bottle of water, I told them, hey, Be careful out there, y'all. There's a tornado warning in this area until 7 a.m. and the rain's picking up. In this area, even on a clear night, it's hard to see what is ahead of you on these dark, desolate roads. As I went to look at the second customer, I realized there was no second customer anymore. I chalked it up to the guy not wanting to wait any longer and decided to just leave. I mean, from what I saw, he didn't have any items with him and probably only needed some cigarettes or something that was behind the counter. I told my customer farewell and was ready to grind out the rest of these hours, but just like a psychic, my own words had foreshadowed my fate for the night. Not long after the customer left, it might have been an hour or so, the sky could no longer hold its sorrow and just wept gallons of tears from above. To me, this is not a big deal. Bad weather, rain, and possums, yeah, I still have it out for them, happened a lot in my area. So much so that I call the experience HWA, which stands for Humid, Wet, and Annoying. 
As the rain and wind picked up, I started to feel a little uneasy. Mostly because, honestly, I would rather be at my house when the rain and wind decided to battle for dominance. With that being said, the inevitable happened. The power lines were no match for the relentless punishment from the elements and then... Darkness. Silence. Aggravation. The power had gone out, and there was no backup generator for me. I was just there, standing in a blanket of darkness so thick that it seemed to cover everything in its embrace. I called my manager to let him know that the power had gone out and asked him what I should do right now. Of course, with it being so late, slash early, whatever 4am means to you, there was no response. I thought about locking up and just buckling down at the gas station until the storm passed. After all, I was getting paid. But that's when I heard it. Between the thunder, between the rain, between the wind, I heard a slight crunch coming from one of the aisles further away from the entrance of the station. At first, I paid no mind to the sound. I believed it to just be store items shifting with all of the terrible weather. Darkness had a way of bending your mind, making you see and hear things that your mind usually dismisses as just the wind. But after sitting there for a while, upset of course, but getting paid, I called my manager again, but unfortunately no answer. Then, right after the light of my phone faded and my eyes were trying to adjust to the darkness, I heard it again. Movement. Movement, but this time closer, and right in between my phone call and a thunderstrike. Like I said, I have listened to this channel for years, so now I'm on high alert. Someone was in here. I was not alone. I just knew it. I tried to calm my nerves, not wanting to be that guy who overreacts, but I asked myself, can you ever really be too safe? I made a potentially dangerous and thoughtless move. I stood up and yelled, Is anybody still in here? I got no response, but that didn't mean that there was no one there. The air felt thick from humidity. Not just that, though. That feeling you get when you're not alone. The feeling of being watched, as cliche as it sounds. I remembered something that I knew all along. There is no ding on the door to let me know when customers enter or exit. That and the thought of that second customer came to mind. I never saw him leave. I just knew that he was there and then gone. Automatically, without a doubt, felt that something was strange, something was not right. So I did what any gas station worker would do in the pitch black. Pretended to be a ninja so that I could slowly make my way to the source of the noise without being caught. As it turns out, I'm not a ninja. The moment I stepped from behind the counter that I had been sitting behind, a voice stopped me in my tracks. Give me what you got. Was all that the void softly spoke to me. I froze. Scared. Too scared to say a word or move an inch. When I called out, I wasn't truly expecting a response. Soon I heard footsteps, slow but getting closer. My mind yelled, do something. Run, charge at the sound and hope for the best. After all of that though, I did nothing. Then his face appeared. A face that I wouldn't have seen if my manager hadn't called me back at that moment, allowing my phone to light up. The second customer. As it turns out, he never left. I pretended not to see or know that I recognized him. And again he repeated, Come on, give me what you got now still in a calm and calculating way. I spoke for the first time after noticing that I was holding my breath the whole time. All I have is $250 in the register. He was quiet for a while but then told me, give it over. I wish that I could say that I pulled out some special move that brought the guy down, allowing me to hold him until the police showed up. But this is real life. I gave him the money and luckily for me, he accepted it. He knew that the police would not be here in these parts at this time and with this weather and even if called, it would take at least 30 minutes to get there. A local, I assumed. It had to be, to be so confident. I talked to the manager and the police after all was said and done. My manager apologized that I had to go through that and also apologized for not answering sooner. I told him no worries, everyone deserves sleep. 
I got to leave early, and the manager closed the store for a couple of hours until the next employees came in. I was so lost in a trance after that situation that I truly believed that it still couldn't be real. That couldn't have just happened to me after a couple of years of working there. And that was that, I thought. A funny plot twist. Two weeks later, a man was caught trying to hold up a gas station close to where my job was located. A man that I remembered from that flash of light on my phone. The only difference is, he didn't get away this time. The thing that I can really say that I've learned from all of this is, no matter how comfortable or how much you think you know how each day will play out, always, always be on guard. For a little backstory, this all took place when COVID-19 had shut everything down in March 2020. I was sent home from my college and I had to do with Zoom classes, and I also went back to work at the burger joint that I would work at whenever I was home on breaks. I won't say the name of the place, but it was always very busy, and during COVID it made us even busier due to us being a fast food place, so we never had to close down, but other places in the plaza did. We always had some really crazy and nasty people, but the pandemic just made everyone so much worse. At the time, we had this one regular that would come in who we thought had some mental problems multiple times a week. He would be really emotionless in his talking and just gave really blank dead stares towards everyone and just stood there like a gargoyle, really intimidating and statuesque. He would ride his bike up to the walk-up area and look through the sliding windows until one of us got to taking his order. But he only really liked certain people to take his order and was also very cold towards us. He would order the same thing every time, but once it fresh right out of the grease and handled by once again only certain people. And to make sure of it, he'll intensely stare at us through the pickup window. He would make the other customers outside so uncomfortable that they would walk away or they would just sit in their cars until he left. He used to only come in during the day shifts, but because days were much busier than the night shifts, and with all his demands that he would give us every time, my manager got fed up and told him to no longer come here during the day, thus now making him a night shift problem. During the week, I would work night shifts because of class, and I would usually be clocking out by 10pm. It was around 9.30 and I was closing my side down and starting to clean when he then rolled up on his bike. I happened to be one of the few people he let take his order, so as usual I took his order. He wants everything completely fresh, the standard list of demands, but one demand he gave was new. He always orders a side of fries with his meal, and sometimes to put the fries in the carton we either use a scooper or tongs. He asked us to use the scooper instead of the tongs because it'll give him more fries. Me just wanting him to leave and being close to leaving myself. I just went over and told the fry guy what he wanted. The fry guy just rolled his eyes, knowing how annoying this guy is, and dropped some new fries in the grease for him. The fry guy went on a break shortly after, and the night manager took over a station and waited for the fries to be ready. She didn't know it was this guy though, and she used the tongs to put the fries in the carton. She then hands me the order to pass out. The guy slides open the window, and he told me that she didn't do what he asked and that he wants more fries in his bag, since it looked like she didn't put enough in, which she put plenty in, he just didn't get his way. Once again, just wanting to leave after I'm done with him, I just oblige and go back. My coworker who I'm going to call Lee calls back and says that I shouldn't let him do that. I then called back saying that we've been letting him control us for months, and it's not my problem to handle a manager's problem if he has issues. My night manager hears this and sees it's the guy at the window. They then groan and they ask me what the issue is with him this time. I explained her the story and she went up to him and told him that it makes no difference what she does. He's getting his order fresh every single time by the people he wants to make his order, so to just suck it up and take the bag. She hands in the bag and then storms in the back to finish her inventory. The guy then pokes his arm and head in the window and tries to get one of the other coworkers to remake his order. Coworker and I both said that we're not going to do that since there was nothing even wrong with his food. Well, he doesn't like this, and he actually throws his bag of food inside the store and spills it all over the floor. He sees this and absolutely loses it. 
She runs over to the window that he still went in and then screams at him how he can't disrespect us like this and that we for sure won't be remaking his order now, but we'll give him his money back. He then screams at her and they actually go at it for a few minutes. I call up the night manager and she runs up to also scream at him. As he gives the guy back his money, he actually grabs her arm and then yanks her almost through the window. Now, because of the pandemic, we have these plastic dividers at the top of where the customer would be speaking to. So if that wasn't there, she would have went straight through the window. Now everyone is screaming at this guy to get the hell out of there and that we're calling the cops as he just assaulted a minor. Earlier that week, he had racial slurs screamed at her by a bunch of rednecks because she was black. I felt really bad for her dealing with two big issues that happened in such a short period of time. She broke out of his grasp and ran to the back. The guy didn't even leave. In his crazy twisted mind, he thought he was in the right here. He was running in circles outside of our walk-up area and was actually screaming to himself about E and how he's going to set the cops on us. He tries banging on the windows to further get our attention, but we just ignored him. Four cop cars drove in blocking the entrance and the exit of the drive through so that no one can come in or leave. They talk to him and the guy just isn't grasping that he attacked a minor and he's crazy. The owner of the company sends in the security footage of just what happened to the cops and we set the guy on trespassing. The guy actually had to be escorted off the property because he wouldn't leave. He thankfully hasn't come in since that day, but we still see him riding around the road next to our place, and he gives us menacing looks every time he passes by, not once breaking eye contact. He really wasn't right in the head. The dead stares he would give us through the windows, the emotionless way he would speak to us, how picky he was with everything and how quick he snapped and resorted to violence. It was insane. Very fortunately, E didn't get any injuries from the incident and was only shaken up, but she did quit a few weeks later, and I can't really blame her. I feel really bad for her. No one should ever have to deal with being assaulted by customers or having racial slurs spewed at them. She was way too young to have to deal with that. I work part-time at a grocery store, and I usually work the closing shift. About 30 minutes to close, a lady comes up to my register. She's polite, friendly, and she seemed pretty normal. She pays for her groceries, I hand her the receipt, and she leaves. Seemed normal enough. Well, about 10 minutes after we close, I headed out to my bike, but she had actually stopped me right before I left the store claiming that she had left her phone inside the store and that she needed to get it. Well, she hadn't left her phone. It would have been in my register and I had thoroughly cleaned it as well as its surrounding area right before I had clocked out. But I had offered to go in and check on it anyway because maybe it had dropped at the floor or something. I wanted to go home and luckily my manager had offered to call her phone, so I headed to my bike to get going. The moment that I take the lock off my bike, she drives over to me making small talk. It's a bit weird seeing as I'm clearly trying to get home and I mean she doesn't know me at all. She tells me that I have a cool bike, asking me where I got it. I explain to her that it's electric and that I just got it from Amazon. She tells me that she didn't know they made electric bikes and then a few minutes later says, I've actually been looking to get an electric bike for a while now. Really weird stuff. She asked to take a picture of my bike and then suddenly asked me why I was still wearing a mask, then going on about how it could give me sinus problems. I decide not to take it off since she's taking a photo, which I noticed the camera is aimed more at me than my bike, even though that I stepped away so that she could get a better view of the bike by itself. Unknown to me, my manager and another worker were watching this whole interaction, and after this woman finally left, they came over to me and asked if I was okay. I didn't really think too much of it, telling them that it was fine and that all she wanted to know was about my bike. I headed home, but while I was on my way there, I thought a bit more about the whole interaction. She came back to the store claiming to have lost her phone, but then had it on her the whole time. She took a picture with it. She also kept repeating my name in our conversation as often as she could, almost like she was trying to memorize it. She took a photo of me as well as my mode of transportation, all while trying to get me to take my mask off right before taking it, 
as if to be able to see my entire face or something. Sort of creepy. Even weirder was when I turned my back to the store to see if she was still there. I saw a police car, which after leaving the parking lot, turned on its sirens and then sped off in the direction that the lady left in. Maybe I'm overthinking, but this interaction just really seemed strange to me. Anyway, I want you guys to let me know if you think I'm overthinking things or if you'd be creeped out too. I'm really wondering now if it's just all in my head. I work at a regional grocery store. I'm a 26 year old female. I graduated from college with a master's degree in psychology and still couldn't find a job. Due to family circumstances, I wasn't able to get my PhD, which was basically the bare minimum to land any decent paying job. So, I was a little stuck. I even had a hard time finding a regular job. I had applied to a bunch of lower positions, but I kept getting rejected because I was overqualified. Over and over again, people told me that I would get too bored on the job, and so they wouldn't hire me. This made me livid. After a certain point, my student loan payments were due and I really needed the money. I had to ask my cousin's friend for a job. He was the manager at this regional grocery store. Literally the only position they had available was stocking shelves on night shift. I couldn't believe myself. I was so ashamed. I felt like I'd wasted years of my life and thousands of dollars in debt just to get a job anyone could do. But either way, the job itself wasn't all that bad. I was allowed to listen to my earbuds while I worked. This meant I could turn on my favorite podcast while working. My favorite murder, if you're wondering. I must have worked there for about a year before the big change came. Previously, the store closed down at 12 in the morning, but for whatever reason, that policy got changed and it became a 24-hour store with the exception of holidays and Sunday nights. It really sucked. What used to be my podcast and stock the shelves time kept getting interrupted by stupid customers asking where things were. That was fine. I didn't mind helping people out. I worked there after all. But they would literally ask me where the most obvious grocery items were. So many times I couldn't help but think, are you literally blind or stupid? But then there was one night when a very strange man came up to me. He had really buggish eyes. Entire body was round and... He had the longest nose hair I'd ever seen on a human being. It was like he took the hair right off of his head and glued it into his nose. I was down on my knees stocking the bottom shelf with pickles when he touched my hair. I had my hair in a ponytail that night and he lightly caressed the part of it that was touching my back. I jerked back and asked, Excuse me? He tried playing it off like he had arthritis, but I knew that he was just being a creep. I asked him what he wanted. He stood there for a second. He seemed to be thinking of what to say, but only one word came out of his mouth. You. He walked up closer to me and then started to smell my shoulder. It felt so weird and I don't think I could have been more creeped out. I told him that if he doesn't need any help finding any items, then I had work I had to be doing. But he kept standing there. He started smiling real wide and then hugged me. It's okay, darling. I'm going to take care of you. At this point, I was screaming inside of my own head. This freak was crossing a million different lines. I pushed him off of me and ran to get my manager, who was a larger guy. He'd have no problem fighting this creep if it came to it. The creepy guy followed me as I went too. The nerve on this guy. When he saw my manager down the aisle... He must have had second thoughts because he turned around and started running away. I explained to my manager everything that had happened and he said he'd take care of it if that guy came back again. And that creep was smart because he waited a couple of weeks before he did come back. He waited long enough that the incident would not be on the tip of anyone's mind. I wasn't expecting him and neither was my manager. I was standing there stocking a shelf like I always did and all of a sudden I felt someone tugging my hair. They tugged really hard and it really hurt my neck. They totally overpowered me and started dragging me across the floor. At this point, I hadn't even realized who it was until I looked up to see that man. He must have dragged me a solid 30 feet to the exit before someone saw what was going on. It wasn't my manager, but it was another one of the girls who worked with me. She started screaming like a banshee and running at him. 
and for one reason or another he decided to run away again. I was beyond relief. I couldn't believe that he was just going to walk up to me and start dragging me out of the store by my hair. What kind of psycho does that? It was all just truly horrifying. This was finally the incident that convinced the store owner that we had to have security if we were going to be open at night. We had a security guard somewhere on the premises after that and I felt a lot safer. I'm still looking for a job in psychology and I really hope I can get one soon. I felt like I really needed a break after having gone through all of this. In June of 2018, Boston area anesthesiologist Jaleesa Jackson and Chidozi Iwandu decided on a week's vacation in Southern California. 29-year-old Jaleesa and 28-year-old Chidozi had met while studying at the prestigious Johns Hopkins University of Medicine down in Baltimore and were already an item by the time they moved up to Boston together. Their personal life was hallmarked by a deeply loving romantic relationship but their professional lives were deeply stressful, with each routinely working 14-hour shifts either five or six days a week, and even on their days off, they were sometimes called into work to conduct essential medical procedures. Each of them found this lifestyle to be utterly exhausting, so when it came time to pick a vacation spot, they chose a place as far away from Boston as they possibly could, Los Angeles. After traveling 3,000 miles across the country, they checked into a small oceanside guest house they'd rented via Airbnb. The place had some truly excellent reviews, and its owner was so popular with those that rented from him that the company had designated him a superhost, meaning he provided almost flawless customer service while making himself easily available to those that stayed at the property. Waiting for them at the property was a chilled bottle of wine, along with a friendly welcome note from the owner who referred to themselves as JJ. He wished them a delightful stay, thanked them for their custom, then left his contact details just in case they needed anything. Then, feeling like they were in safe hands, Jaleesa and Chidozi packed away their things, then settled in for the night. They believed that they were in for a dream vacation, the perfect anecdote to their high-pressure, career-driven lives. Yet little did they know, their vacation would turn into a living nightmare. Around 5.30 the next morning, the couple woke up to the sound of a loud and violent banging sound coming from the front door. The commotion just about frightened the life out of them, but a brave Jaleesa grabbed her phone, readied herself to call 911, then approached the front door to see what was going on. As she got closer, she heard a rough male voice barking. I know you're in there, Kevin. Jaleesa peered through the door's peephole, spying an unhinged, enraged man on the other side, and after barking at him to get away from the property, she decided to call JJ to let him know what was going on. But then, just as the dial tone started, the sound of a phone ringing could be heard from the other side of the door. Jaleesa then opened the door, looked the man dead in the face, and asked, JJ? Yet the man simply looked up at her with a startled look on his face, then ran off into the night. As you can imagine, Jaleesa was horribly confused, as was Chidozi when the details of the incident were relayed to him. Then, demanding an answer, Jaleesa began calling JJ incessantly until he finally answered his phone. JJ seemed completely unapologetic regarding the bizarre incident and told Jaleesa, Yeah, that was me. Sorry about the confusion, but that's too short for me to give you an explanation. Have a nice time in L.A. Jaleesa tried to fish for more of an explanation, bemused and outraged that a so-called superhost, who had seemed so warm and friendly in their welcome note, had turned out to be anything but. Yet before she had a chance to ask him anything, JJ hung up on her. Maybe things are just different on the West Coast, Jaleesa told Chidozi in an attempt to explain JJ's bizarre and alarming behavior and both agreed that it certainly made for a memorable welcome to one of the United States' most famous cities. The couple then spent the day at a nearby beach, and by the time the sun began to set, that morning's incident was almost completely forgotten. When they were done at the beach, Jaleesa and Chidozi made their way back to their Airbnb, with the remainder of their evening being pleasantly uneventful. 
They finished off the rest of their wine, ate some of the best tacos they'd ever eaten in their lives, then sank into bliss while enjoying a saccharine rom-com courtesy of Netflix. It was only after they'd retired to bed did the terror ramp up exponentially. Shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning, the couple was scared out of their skin when a hooded figure literally came crashing through the large window of their darkened bedroom. The violent intrusion sent shards of glass everywhere, and both halves of the couple let out screams of terror as the figure smashed their way into the bedroom. I had no idea what was happening, Chidozi recalled, but I reacted like we were under attack. In an instant, the 230-pound, six-foot Shidozi leapt on the man as he simply lay there motionless on the bedroom floor. He tore up his bare feet on the broken glass in the process, but the surging adrenaline meant he barely felt it. In that moment, all that mattered was securing and detaining the maniacal intruder so that they wouldn't be free to harass them again. As he shoved his knee into the intruder's back, Shidozi screamed at Jalisa to call 911. He later said that he'd feared that the man might be hiding a weapon, or that more intruders might be attempting to force their way into the residence. As Jalisa grabbed her phone and rushed to call 911, her boyfriend barked at her to hide under the table, just in case any other armed men were about to burst into the bedroom. As she did so, Jalisa made a mental note of the man's attire, the goal of which was to provide as accurate a description as possible to the emergency dispatcher. Yet when she tried to get a look at his face, and as the hood of his jacket began to work its way back from his face, she noticed something that instantly sent chills through her. JJ? She called out, recognizing their so-called super host as the man who had just smashed his way into their bedroom. Chidozi was so shocked by his girlfriend's cry that he took his knee off of JJ's back, turning him over to confirm that the person terrorizing them was actually their apparent benevolent landlord. At the moment he loosened his grip, JJ tore himself free, then bolted from the building as fast as his legs could carry him. Minutes later, Jaleesa Jackson was telling the police that they had just been attacked by their own Airbnb host, and that he had gone crazy, and that they needed assistance as soon as possible. Then, while awaiting the arrival of armed officers, Jaleesa and Chidozi armed themselves with the biggest kitchen knives, then hunkered down in preparation for another assault. Yet while they waited, they suddenly heard the sounds of a helicopter hovering overhead. Then moments later, the courtyard between the guest house and the main house was awash with flashing lights. Jaleesa then noticed two police officers leading a handcuffed man back towards the property. It was JJ, and he was ranting and raving about cleaning fees. He had apparently told the police that he had ordered his tenants to move out after they failed to pay cleaning fees, but as commotion unfolded, an elderly woman emerged from the main house and asked what was going on. It turned out that the woman was the property's true owner, and that she had rented the guest house out to JJ on the condition that he wouldn't sublet it from anyone else. Jaleesa and Chidozi told her that, as far as they knew, JJ rented the place out all the time and that it was in fact his primary source of income. They asked her how she hadn't noticed all the people coming and going with luggage, but the woman meekly replied that she thought that they were all just JJ's friends. Thankfully, after placing a few calls to Airbnb, the company refunded the couple the full $708 they had paid to rent the guest house, and also offered to relocate them to another property at no additional cost. However, due to the trauma they'd experienced, Jaleesa and Chidozi had no desire to patronize Airbnb in the future, and checked into a local Hilton hotel, even though it cost them an additional $2,300 to do so. In the aftermath, they sought $5,000 worth of compensation from Airbnb, owing to the terror and trauma they'd experienced. But after a period of intense haggling with the company's grievance department, the best offer they could get was two and a half grand. Airbnb did offer to sweeten the deal by paying for five therapy sessions for each of the couple, which they argued would tip the total compensation amount to well over $5,000, but Jaleesa and Chidozi refused. If you think that seems extremely miserly of Airbnb, you'd be right, as according to Forbes magazine, the company is worth around $38 billion, 
with an annual revenue of just over $2 billion. Almost every single night, a jaw-dropping 2 million people stay in Airbnb properties in over 8,000 cities around the world. So surely, they have the revenue to properly compensate a couple who went through something so horrific and traumatic. And for a company whose entire business model is based on trust, and who proclaims your safety is our priority, the incident in LA shows a chilling failure of Airbnb's screening system. The company itself has claimed that no screening system is perfect. But while this remains the case, couples like Jalisa and Chidozi will continue to be at the mercy of crooks and villains who only wish to prey on their fellow man. I opened up my home as an Airbnb, and within the first month I ended up unlisting it from the website and scrapping the entire idea. You see, my wife and I have been trying to sell our old home for over a year before we decided to turn it into an Airbnb, so we didn't really have strict rules about the place. As long as it was kept nice and the guests cleaned up after themselves, our plan was to let anyone stay there for as long as they needed to. The only thing that we did when we listed the house was get a single security camera that we placed in plain view at the entrance of the house facing the front door. That way we could see anyone who entered the home. Now the first two guests that we hosted were so friendly and kept the house very clean. So my wife and I were actually very excited that we decided to take a chance on renting out our old home. That quickly changed though when one day I checked the camera after our third set of guests had supposedly left. They finished up their booking and when it was done, we got the text that they had left the key on the counter and we thanked them for their business. When I checked the camera, however, I noticed that was facing the opposite direction and all I could see was the wall behind it. I called my wife, who was still at work, and let her know that I was going to be running over to the old home to check on it and fix the camera. And then I got into my truck and made my way down the road. The house that we listed for Airbnb was only about 25 minutes from the house that we currently lived in, so I got there in no time. However, it was around 7.30 at night, so the driveway was pretty dark when I pulled into it. I figured that they must have just turned the porch light off and forgot to turn it back on before leaving. Again, it was no big deal, but I definitely noticed how dark it was. I carefully made my way up the gravel path and to the front door of the house, and this is where things took a serious turn. As I reached out for the handle, the door ended up swinging open on its own without me even touching it. I was really confused by that, so I took a second before walking inside, but as I looked into the house, I couldn't see anything unusual. Eventually, I mustered up the courage and made my way through the threshold and into the home. That was when I felt something hard hit me from behind. I dropped to my knees and then turned around as fast as I could to see what had hit me, and that was when I saw someone standing in my house holding something in their hand that looked like a bat or pole of some sort. I put my hands up in front of my face to protect myself from any incoming attack, but that was when I was grabbed from behind by another assailant. They pulled me to the ground and held me there as the man who struck me in the back began digging through my pockets. They pulled my phone, my keys, and my wallet out of my pocket before letting me go. But I didn't even get to pick myself off the ground before I was struck over the head with a bat again. Everything around me went black as I fell back to the ground. I woke up a couple of hours later to my wife who was shaking me awake. She said that an ambulance was on the way and that she had come to check on me after she got home from work and noticed that I still wasn't back. My wife also told me that my car wasn't in the driveway and I knew right away that they had stolen it. After the ambulance came, I told my wife to call the police and to cancel the cards that we had in my wallet. I ended up needing three stitches on my forehead where I had been hit by the one assailant, and according to the police, there was no evidence that would help us find them. They never even found my car. We immediately chose to unlist the house from Airbnb and just try to continue to sell it. So, I've owned an Airbnb for quite a few years now. It wasn't a big home, just enough where you can maybe have two or three people over. However, my house is located right near Miami Beach with a nice area, so it was common for people to take notice. Ever since the pandemic had started to die down, my house got booked several times as life began to get back to normal. 
I didn't mind it though, as I made decent money due to the location and condition. Normally, I'd receive several bookings wanting to use my house for parties and whatnot. Just a few weeks ago, however, I had gotten an older couple who just wanted it for a few nights together. It wasn't a bad thing, but rather surprising considering it was just two people. I'd like to mention that I rarely see or communicate with the people who use the house unless they needed something. Anyway, it had been day two of this day and I was at my girlfriend's apartment having dinner when my phone goes off. I look at it and see that it's the couple texting me. I could only assume it was bad news and I open the message to them telling me that there was a leak in the water heater. This was weird as I make sure everything in the house is in pristine condition when booked. However, no running water was unacceptable and I tell my girlfriend that I'd be back and that I was going to fix it. Upon arriving to the house, I immediately noticed that there were now two cars in the driveway. Figuring that they must have had people over, I dismiss it even though it wasn't really allowed. I go inside the house and the husband tells me that there's a water heater leak in the garage. I politely tell him that I'd get it fixed and that he had nothing to worry about. We head to the garage and he shows me where the leak was and points to the nut from where the water goes through. However, the so-called problem he was complaining about was something a person without a brain could easily fix. The bolts of the water heater had been loosened and was far from broken. As a matter of fact, I could now see one of my wrenches sitting on top of the heater, indicating that this was done on purpose. It was then when I started to get an uncomfortable feeling as the man just stood there staring at me. I take the wrench and tighten the screw, stopping the leaking water. Uh, well, it's fixed. Enjoy the rest of your stay. He then profusely tells me to wait and asks if I could help him with one last thing. He tells me that there was something wrong with the cable in the guest bedroom. Now the guest bedroom is upstairs and when I looked at it, I noticed that it was completely dark up there. He gestures me to go first, to which I tell him why. He then tells me that it was my house and that he didn't want to be rude. I hesitantly walk slowly up the stairs toward the dark hallway. As I'm about halfway up the stairs, I can very faintly see someone standing at the top of the stairs staring down at me. Even through the pitch darkness, I can see this person holding something with a shade of yellow. It only took me another few seconds to realize that it was a crowbar. I stop dead in my tracks and turn around and tell him that I had to go, but that I'd be back later. However, instead of persuading me to go upstairs, he simply stared toward me and said nothing as I left the house. At this point, I'm inside of my car on the phone with the police telling them the situation. I didn't go back to my house until the police gave me the update, which eventually of course they did. Upon arrival, they were shocked to find that nobody was there and no signs of any damage. The only things that were stolen was a flower vase my mom had given me and the TV. Needless to say, I stopped using that house as an Airbnb as I didn't want to take any chances. Miami police were never able to identify who these people were or where they were. While it was a sucky situation, three questions still remain unanswered. What were their intentions? Who was holding that crowbar? And what would have happened had I gone up the stairs? It gives me goosebumps till this day. This took place in 2019 in my last semester of college. My friends and I had just finished finals and decided we would go on a road trip for a few days. Since hotel prices were through the roof, we decided we would rent an Airbnb instead. This took place right by the coast of Cali, so you could imagine how nice it was. 
The house we were staying at was a beach house and had all the decor of anything that was related to a beach. On top of that, the house was really nice and kept clean. For the first few nights, everything went well with no problems. However, that was until our last night there, when we were all asleep except for me. Throughout my life, I've always had trouble sleeping. I wasn't sure why, but whatever the reason was went into my adulthood and stuck with me ever since. As I'm rolling around in my bed, I hear footsteps in the kitchen. The floors of this house were made of wood, so it was easy to hear someone. Assuming it was probably one of my friends, I dismiss it until I realized that there was something off. These footsteps sounded way too heavy, and out of curiosity, I opened my door, and what I saw nearly gave me a heart attack. Standing about six feet away was a large man dressed in all black. The minute they see me, they run across the house and out the back door. My screaming woke up the rest of my friends, and we call the police. However, given that it was dark out with the lights off, I couldn't give a good description other than he was tall. The police would eventually find this person, as it turns out that he had broken into several houses in the area. Needless to say, we ended our stay early and went back home the same night. One of the strangest Airbnbs that I ever experienced wasn't actually a standalone house, but instead it was a room in this large house. The host had listed four different rooms on Airbnb, and then all of the guests just shared the large common area. It wasn't too bad to get used to on my first day there. I mean, sure it was weird to share a house with strangers, but because I was on a road trip by myself and only needed a single room for a few days, it seemed like a sweet deal. Now the one thing that stood out to me when I met the host and the person who lived in the master bedroom was that they claimed no place in the house was off limits except for the basement. He seemed very adamant that none of us go near the basement. That didn't seem like it would be a problem for me and honestly I wasn't even remotely interested in what was down there because I was so focused on the woods that surround the large house that the host owned. It seemed like the perfect place to go for a hike or ride quads. I was really jealous that they got to live there full time. At least, that was the case at first. I started feeling a lot less comfortable once I noticed that the host seemed to follow me around everywhere I went. It was something I could let slide at first though, considering I was a guest in his house. That changed when he approached me in the kitchen on my second night there though. I was sitting at the kitchen table drinking a glass of water and scrolling through my phone when I noticed the host walk over to me and stare down as if he wanted to talk. So I put my phone down and asked him how his night was going. And without a moment's notice, he began to raise his voice at me. He claimed that he saw me looking at the door to the basement and very loudly told me that it was his private space and to leave it alone. I tried to explain to him that I didn't even know which door was in the basement, but he didn't want to hear it and just continued yelling at me. I ended up apologizing to the host just to get him to calm down and then I ended up going into my room for the night. As time passed, I had a hard time falling asleep in my room after that altercation. And just as I was about to pass out, I heard the sound of someone knocking on the door of the room next to mine. I listened closely as one of the other guests answered. I could hear the host ask them to follow him, and I just decided to ignore it and continue to go to sleep. However, before I could manage to do that, I heard another noise. Only this time it was one that I'm pretty sure the entire house could hear. Someone was clearly screaming at the top of their lungs on the first floor. At first I was frozen with fear from the bone-chilling scream. But as the shrieking continued, I knew that I had to check it out. I wasn't alone in my curiosity though. As I entered the hall, I saw another guest that was staying at the house peeking out of her room as well. The screaming continued as I walked through the hall and made my way down the stairs. And as I reached the first floor, I realized something that truly haunts me still. The screaming was coming from the basement. I decided that I needed to get help for whoever was down there and ended up running back upstairs and grabbed my phone. I called the police as fast as I could and then quickly got the other guest out of the house. As we sat in the driveway waiting for the police to come, the screaming ended up stopping. I locked my eyes on the house to make sure that the owner wasn't coming out, 
and I practically jumped out of my skin when I noticed the silhouette of a man standing at the window staring out at us. They slowly backed away from the window and disappeared into the darkness of the house. I watched the door as I fully expected the owner to come out and attack us or something, but thankfully the police showed up before anything like that happened. I explained to the officers what had happened and they quickly rushed into the house and made their way to the basement. However, what was really shocking was the fact that the house was supposedly empty. When they checked the entire place out, they couldn't find anyone. All they saw was that the back door to the home was left wide open as if the owner had run out the back and into the woods. After giving our statements to the police, we were all escorted inside to get our belongings and then we all went our separate ways. To this day, I don't know who was screaming in that basement or where they went, but I can't help but shake the feeling that something horrible happened in that house that night. My sister and I have never been on a holiday together, just the two of us. We went several times with our mom together, my parents are divorced, but my mother was the stressful kind of holiday planner. Cultural tours here, a day-long bus trip there, and back on the plane we are again. So we decided to book a five-day trip to a place we'd never been to. The both of us never can stand being at a place for more than a week, it just gets boring and we are restless adventurers. We traveled with Airbnb for the first time and the place was amazing. It was on the top floor of the building with a huge balcony from which you could look down on the intersection till the end of each street. One street led directly to the port. If you followed it down past tennis courts and some parking lots from hotels around a curve. My sister and I always went out for dinner. The seafood was great and as the days passed, we explored further and further away from our apartment for new restaurants. On the last day, we found a place that served sea urchin, which was about 45 minutes away from home. Greek people are so friendly. When you eat lunch or dinner, dessert is always free and they set you up with rocky, a very strong, and for me as an inexperienced drinker, painful, little brandy that packs a punch if you finish it quickly. This being the fifth day already, I couldn't stand drinking more than one shot glass, so I left the rest of the small bottle to my sister. She said it would be rude to leave a gift, she can also handle a lot more alcohol than me. We left the place stuffed and with satisfied thirst, walking along the port home to our place. The streets are always full of tourists, but only until the curve I mentioned before. Once you reach the tennis courts, there are about 200 meters up street to the intersection where our house is. What we didn't expect were that a group of gypsies set up their night camp on the parking lots in the light of the tennis court. If you are not aware of the situation, Greece is overall a landing port for refugees and gypsies, although we didn't see many of them around Heraklion. I felt uneasy because we were the only two girls in the street, besides the group of people getting ready to sleep. My sister was a little happy from the alcohol when I suddenly heard shuffling steps behind me. I could see the shadow of a skinny but tall man. I listened closely to his steps. He was still far enough away from me so that he couldn't suddenly grab me, but I felt very uneasy as I was wearing high platforms and directing my sister in front of me. He starts picking up the pace, clearly trying to adjust his walking to our pace. Hey, hi. I don't answer him. He comes up to my right. Hi. I size him up, skinny but muscular. There is something wrong with his leg. His hip seems to be limping. Nope. Not the kind of person I'd like to talk to in the middle of the night. My sister asks me, Who is that? I don't know, keep walking. He passes me and tries to speak to my sister, maybe thinking she would be easier to convince because she looks drunkish. He starts speaking in a foreign language, which we obviously don't speak. She sheepishly tells him, What? English. Uh, we only speak English. I run up to my sister and pull her with me onto the street. Don't talk to him, keep moving. That's when he tries to grab her by the arm and pull her back. I am tense at this moment. With a face of, don't you touch my sister, I step up to the guy and shove him with my hands in the chest and shout at him, No! Because of his limp, he stumbles backwards. I keep looking at him when I take the hand of my sister and walk faster. That's when he starts grinning. Ah! Oh. Finally we reach the intersection and run into the house. The front door is always open so I hurriedly get my sister into the elevator into the third floor. My sister is clearly shaken up from the guy trying to grab her, but rather angry than scared. We lock the door and leave the lights out. 
From the balcony, we can see the guy walking into the entrance of our house, in and out for at least an hour before he finally left. I'm an 18-year-old female, and this happened to me just last week while working. For context, I work for a widely popular pizza chain around the country as a delivery driver. I won't name the place or location, I mean, I'm not getting paid for advertisement. Anyway, the restaurant was busy all day every day, which meant that I'd be doing deliveries left and right. Business wouldn't start to slow down until at least an hour before closing, so it was hectic to say the least. One night, my boss had called me in on my day off, asking if I was able to work that night as someone had called out. After all, I wasn't really doing anything that night, so I said why not and drove over to work. The second I get there, I clock in and it was then when our phone rang with a man's voice requesting a large pie. However, the second he knew I was a female, the tone in his voice completely changed. In a sort of flirtatious manner, he had given me the address and how he wanted the pizza delivered. I told my coworker that he needed one regular and to hand it to me when ready. It was then when I noticed the order barely met our delivery radius and I even asked my boss if it was still worth doing. I could tell he was in sort of a rush and didn't have time for questions or concerns so I decided to do it. I put in the guy's address and went on my way to do what I hoped was my last delivery. It wasn't too far out, but it was then when I realized that the area I was in wasn't the best in town. It was one of those areas with run-down homes and unkept lawns where you'd commonly hear sirens every now and then. And, being a small, petite college student, it was concerning being around here as crime here was at its highest. It was sketchy, but knew I could finally go home once I completed the delivery. I pull up to the townhouse my GPS led me to and immediately see that there were no cars in the driveway. However, there was a single light on, meaning there was indeed someone home. For those of you who don't know what a townhouse is, it's basically several homes fused together into one. Anyway, I step out of the car with the pizza in hand and knocked on the door as there was no doorbell. Within a minute, the door opens and I was greeted to a man who appeared to be in his mid-twenties wearing, out of all clothes, a tuxedo. He was tall and his hair was a mess and honestly looked disheveled. The smell of strong alcohol could be noticed from his clothes which wasn't attractive at all. He greeted me, introducing himself as Nate, and immediately grabbed the pizza from my hands. He opens it and looks back at me with a smile and says, You know, I wouldn't be able to eat this pizza by myself. Would you mind coming inside to share? I uncomfortably laugh and politely decline, telling him I had to go home and that I had to watch the carbs. However, he then insists telling me how he was this great guy and how he could buy me all these nice things. This time in a more direct tone, I tell him no thank you, but that he was very thoughtful and to have a nice night. Suddenly, he then stops me, telling me he forgot to give me my tip. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a $5 bill and handed it to me, making sure our hands touched. Now, this is the part where things really took a turn for the worst. As I was about to turn around and leave to go home, I hear clear as day this loud and blood-curdling scream from upstairs. He looks up at the pitch-dark hallway of his house and then back at me. It was then where his demeanor completely changed. This time, in a more serious tone of voice, he had said, Yeah, uh, I think it's time for you to go. I felt my blood run cold as he said this, and ran back to the car, pulling out of his driveway, not looking back. As I'm in the car, I'm calling my boss, who was still at the restaurant, practically crying to him about the situation. 
He had said to come right back and that he was calling the police. When I arrived, police were already outside waiting with my boss. For a good while, I was questioned and gave them the address I made the delivery to. It's safe to say I didn't hear anything from police for a good week until I finally got a call back. Turns out, the man who I had made the delivery to had actually owned the house with his parents. The woman screaming was his now ex-girlfriend who he had caught cheating with with another man. The part that disturbed me the most was that he had beat her numerous times after he found out. She had been in his house for days and wouldn't let her leave until she quote, learned a lesson. He was obviously arrested and his ex was taken to a hospital where she thankfully did survive. The next day, I quit my job and now work as a desk representative. If there's one thing I've learned from this, is that always trust your gut when something feels off. Around three years ago, I did deliveries for my dad's pizza business to make extra money for a car I wanted. I had just turned 17 and would do several deliveries for my dad whenever I could. I hated the idea of running the register or doing dishes, so my dad let me do deliveries instead. Realistically speaking, I'd work maybe 15 hours a week to help with my dad, and being a small business, we'd maybe get about 4 or 5 deliveries a day. If we didn't get deliveries that day, I'd always help my dad with cooking whenever he needed it. One night before closing, I had been sweeping the floor when my dad asks me if I could do one last delivery. I was tired, but knowing how hard my dad worked and how badly I wanted that car, I agreed. The customer who had ordered was located on the opposite side of town, which meant it would be a longer drive. I put the order into the back of the car, a single large pie, and got on the road. My GPS led me to the more rural side of town, the type of place where you would commonly see run-down homes and stuff like that. I had already been skeptical of this part of town, but realized it was another tip at the end of the day. I arrived to the house and I immediately noticed the red flags. Not a single light was on inside and there were no cars in the driveway. A chill ran down my spine as I saw this, as I had never seen anything more sketchy. However, I always knew that you had to do things in life you didn't want to do, so I bit my lip and walked up to the house. The doorbell was completely damaged, so I knocked. Silence filled the air until I very faintly heard footsteps approaching the door before it opened. Standing at the door was an older looking man, maybe in his fifties giving me a friendly smile. This made me a bit more relieved now that I felt greeted but was still hesitant. He politely asked if I was the pizza guy, to which I replied with a yes and handed him his food. For whatever reason, I asked him why all of the lights were off in his house. There was a short pause before he finally said it was because the power went out in his neighborhood. However, that's when I noticed that the rest of the homes had at least one light on, so I knew this was a lie. Not wanting to pry and too tired to care, I tell him to have a good night and went on my way. He then stops me and tells me he wanted to give me something special for being such a good person. This was weird, but I walked over to him, and he then tells me to follow him inside. It was at this point where something told me to not do it and to get back in the car. I simply just stood by the door while he insisted I come inside. Now this is the part where things would have taken a terrible turn. As I was standing by the door frame. I could very faintly see, by the stairs, someone wearing what appeared to be a white mask. The man saw the look on my face and must have caught on to my suspicions. 
At that point, I run back to the car and drive the hell out of there not looking back. I take a look in my rearview mirror and thankfully nobody was following me as I left. All the while, I'm hyperventilating while on the phone with my dad telling him everything. He had told me that he'd be on the phone with the police and to come straight home. Long story short, I was questioned by the police when they asked me to name the address. As it turns out, that house had been vacant for years as nobody ever lived there. Needless to say, police still went to that house, but like in most situations like this, whoever was there was gone. I still work for my dad's business, but we made a new rule where we wouldn't accept deliveries past a certain time. It's been a few years now, and nothing has happened since. This incident still comes back to me once in a while, and makes me think about what would have happened had I not seen the man in the mask. I worked as a delivery driver at my local pizza hut when I was a sophomore in college. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was enough to where I could pay bills and other things I wanted. Being a full-time student, I had a flexible work schedule, meaning I'd only work a few times per week. My typical hours were the weekends, which were the busiest days seeing as there were more customers. This incident happened on a Friday night while I was out doing deliveries. For context, I live in a small town of Tennessee, so there would be a lot of land around the area and nobody out on the road. The delivery I had gotten was located on the other side of town, where the more wealthier people resided. This was a plus, as the wealthier people tend to tip more and were generally a lot nicer than most people. I was on a long road with forests on both sides trying to get to the destination when, out of nowhere, I see a car tailing behind me. This wasn't common as these roads are mostly quiet during this time of night. For some reason, I had this feeling of dread inside and figured this person was up to no good. All the while, the car's horn is blaring nonstop to the point where I was trying to figure out what they wanted. All of a sudden, I hear the voice of a man from the car say something, but because of the wind, I couldn't hear him. That's when I slowed down where he yelled again, and that was when I could hear something along the lines of, Your car's on fire. I look in my rearview mirror, and the trunk is full on smoking with small flames coming from my wheels. How I didn't see this, I have no idea, but I start screaming and pull over while running out of the car. Thankfully, the driver of the other car got out and made sure I was okay. Suddenly, a loud boom can be heard from the car, and half of the car is now in flames. Now this is the part where I could only describe to be the work of God. Turns out, this driver wasn't even supposed to be on this road. He had been coming home from work when, for whatever reason, he got this urge to turn onto the street even though it was the wrong way. The feeling was so strong that he thought he was crazy but decided to finally do it and that's when he saw me. When he said that, I stood there in utter shock. It took a while but fire rescue came to put it out while I informed my boss. Unfortunately, the fire department couldn't figure out as to what caused the fire. I had taken a week off from work after that, and all delivery vehicles were inspected. Till this day, I thank that driver for getting me to notice as I thought he didn't have good intentions. If there hadn't been someone on that road that night, God only knows what would have happened to me. Thank God for that driver, and thank God I finally noticed. When I was around 24, I lost my full-time job as a freelance writer due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It got really bad around my area to the point where the company was losing money and had to lay off many workers. 
Because of this, I became broke and nearly got evicted from my apartment. During this time, I had my parents help out with rent and did DoorDash on the side to make some extra income. It wasn't the best paying job, but it helped me get around and paid for things I needed. I ended up doing deliveries pretty often and thought it was the perfect little side hustle. One night, I had been doing deliveries around the suburbs of my city. This was the type of area where you'd normally get more orders, which typically meant you'd get more money. So, I'm driving around when I get a delivery from a local mom and pop type of restaurant. It was a large order, and the person who had ordered it was on the other side of town, which was annoying. However, DoorDash charges more per mile, and seeing as it was a large order, I realized it was a bigger tip. Sucking it up, I drive the 25 minute drive to the given address and eventually pulled into a house with an unkept driveway. The house seemed okay, but the grass was tall and there didn't appear to be any lights on. This should have been the first red flag, but being young and naive, I dismissed it and proceeded with the order. Now, DoorDash has the option for a customer to request their order be left by the door, which is exactly what this person wanted. I walk up to the house, and as I'm about to put their order down, the front door opens where I was greeted to a man. He looked as if he had just woken up, and said in a groggy voice if I was the delivery guy. Clearly annoyed, but not trying to be rude, I tell him yes. Then, for whatever reason, he asks me if I could bring it to his backyard for him, as that's where all of his guests were going to be. Why he was having guests over during the pandemic was his problem, but I wasn't going to get involved. While his request was weird, I didn't think much of it, as it was a large order and was definitely something you couldn't feed one person. Without hesitation, I make my way to the back, and right when I turn the corner, I see four chairs and a dining table beside a shed. As I put the food on the table, I look at the shed, and thought I could see someone looking at me through the window. Even with it being dark out, I could still make out the face to be a woman. However, the weird part about it was that she appeared to be sad for some reason. It was kind of like that look you would give someone, as if their whole life was falling apart. The closest term I could really describe it was depressed or disappointed. It was then where the man had come out and thanked me for my help. I then leave the house to go back home, still confused out of my mind. It wasn't until about a week later where I had met up with a friend in the area when I learned a harsh truth. I had told him about my weird delivery trip the other night to that man's house. Upon describing the man, he said he knew who I was talking about and he would do deliveries for him here and there. It was then where I had mentioned the woman I had seen, and that's when he told me something I didn't know. My friend and this man had managed to strike up a conversation one day and told him something personal. Turns out, his wife had suffered from a heart attack in his backyard one day and didn't survive. He was heartbroken and obviously grieved for a long while after her passing. From time to time, he had caught glimpses of her inside of his gardening shed as she always loved planting. That was her go-to place for whenever she was feeling down or upset. Gardening was always her passion and she'd do it whenever she could. That was the creepiest and saddest experience I've ever had while on any shift. I recently moved across the country to a new town to go to school. I was able to land a job as a pizza delivery driver pretty easily. I've done this job before and I like it because it's relatively easy and I make good money on tips. I work a lot of really late night shifts. A couple of weeks ago, I was working and at about 2 a.m. an order came in. It was for a large cheese pizza. At that hour, it was just a couple of us working, so I made the pizza myself and then put it in my car and went to deliver it. 
I didn't know the area very well, so I would always put the address in on my phone and then just follow the directions. I got in my car and typed it in. It said it was a 15 minute drive. As I drove, it seemed to be taking me into the middle of nowhere. I drove for about 10 minutes through woods with not a building or house in sight. Then finally, I was supposed to turn onto a little dirt road that I could barely see. If it hadn't showed up on my map, I would have almost certainly missed it. I slowed down and then turned onto the little dirt road. The map showed me continuing on this road for about one more mile and then I would take a left and the destination would be there. I began driving down the dirt road, which was surrounded by woods. Then suddenly, my phone lost signal. I wasn't all that surprised being so far out from the city, but I was concerned because I needed to find the house to deliver the pizza. I kept driving very slowly and looked for a road on the left side. Finally, I saw it and I turned. The road was another dirt one, but the woods on each side was even more dense. It was very eerie being out there on that road at that time of night, especially not knowing where I was. I drove down the road very slowly, looking on both sides for a house or some kind of building for whoever ordered a pizza out here. But all I saw was trees from the dense woods and some grass. I still had no service at all on my phone, but I knew I had to be close to where the delivery was supposed to be. It was very dark and hard to see, with the only lights coming from my headlights. I wasn't seeing any kind of buildings at all. I started to get a really creepy feeling being out there, and after about five minutes of driving down that road looking, I decided to turn around and go back, because I could clearly see that there was no buildings. I drove my car back to the other dirt road, and then back to where I had signal before. At last, I was finally able to get connection on my phone, and when I did, I looked at the map again, but the address had been erased and it was not there. I found the card that I had wrote the address on and put it back into my phone, but this time it said address not found. I decided I would just head back and try to figure out what was going on. When I got back to the store, I showed my boss the address and told him what happened. He looked surprised when I gave him this information. Then he told me that there are no houses or buildings in that area at all. I went back to look at the order that had come in, but it was gone. I chalked it up to a lack of sleep, but to this day, I really don't know how to explain what happened. Maybe I was just really tired, but it was still a really creepy experience. I am a pizza delivery driver. This was by far the scariest thing to happen to me. It took place about one year ago. I was working on a Thursday night, which were usually decently busy. I made quite a few deliveries, and the later it got, the more things calmed down. At about one in the morning, I got a delivery for a cheese pizza. I put it into my car and drove to the location, which was about 10 minutes away. It was in an area of town which I rarely delivered to and was a little more run down. I got to the address which was a two-story house with a pretty decent sized yard and many overgrown plants and trees. It looked a little bit run down like most houses in the area and had a front porch that seemed to wrap around the house. I got out of my car, grabbed the pizza and walked up the driveway to the house. Then I walked up the steps to the door and rang the doorbell. About 30 seconds went by, and I was about to ring the bell again when the door started to open. A man answered. He was fairly large and bald and looked to be in his 50s. He just stood there staring at me for a second. I said I had his pizza and handed it to him. He looked almost surprised and said, Oh, okay, that's nice. Then he just looked around. He just seemed a little bit strange to me. Then he said to me that he had to get some cash to tip me and he would be right back. He went back inside and closed the door. I stood there waiting for a good two or three minutes, but the man still didn't return. I was thinking about just leaving when I heard some noise and figured the man must be coming back. But when I listened closer, it wasn't coming from inside. 
It was coming from outside on the porch. I looked around to the direction of the noise. Then I saw from the side of the house on the porch three men approaching me about 30 feet away. I guess it was just an instinct, but as soon as I saw them, I turned and sprinted back down the porch to the driveway. When I did, I heard all the men start to chase after me. I ran as fast as I could to my car and unlocked it and then jumped inside. I frantically started the engine and stepped on the gas. As soon as my car started moving forwards, the men reached me. I felt one of them kick my back door and another one tried opening the door on the other side, but I was just barely able to drive away. I sped out of the neighborhood and all the way back to the pizza place. I have to think that the pizza delivery was some sort of trap to lure me into getting robbed or maybe even worse. I haven't delivered to that area much since, but when I do, I'm extra careful. So, I had this part-time job when I was in high school, working as a pizza delivery driver for a large pizza chain. I saw some pretty wild stuff on the job, but only one thing that actually seriously creeped me out. I'm making this routine delivery to some innocuous looking house, but when the guy answers the door, he just sort of grabs the pizza, thrusts a fistful of ones in my face, then slams the door behind him. At first, I'm just like, rude. But then when I count the money, I find that not only has this guy not given me enough for his 20 inch meat lovers, but he's not even bothered to tip me. I'd been burned once or twice before when it came to my count and the difference ended up coming out of my wages so I was not about to let that nonsense happen a third time. I ended up banging on the guy's door for like a solid five minutes before he answered. Like I could see him moving around behind the frosted glass panel but totally ignoring my knocking. In the end, I lose my temper and say something like, Hey man, don't try and finesse me out of money. I don't want to have to call the cops, but I will. Boom. Those were the magic words. He comes right up to the front door and opens it up. Not all the way, maybe a third of the way open. This guy is saying sorry a whole lot. Like almost too much. He's all pale. He's sweating. His hands are shaking as he passes me out of 20, just laying the sorry the whole time. I'm just thinking, what's this guy's problem? But then I catch a glimpse of something in the hallway behind the guy, and suddenly I've got a good idea what the guy's deal was. There's a dark red stain on the wooden floor, maybe the size of a manhole cover, and next to it are what look like all kinds of different cleaning products. I take one quick look at that, then at the guy, and he just slams the door in my face. I'm back in my car and speeding back to the pizza place faster than you can say F that, and as soon as I get there, I call the cops. As it turned out, I had legit interrupted this guy, cleaning up a murder. And from what I heard, the guy was having an affair with a high school girl that was like 30 years his junior. She's over at his place while his wife is out of town, orders pizza at some point, then before it even arrives, the guy kills her because she's threatening to ruin his marriage or something. He had no clue that she'd ordered the pie, panics when I show up at the door, and that's how he got caught. Crazy story, right? But for me, the craziest part isn't so much the whole murderous infidelity thing. It's that before she was murdered, this girl unwittingly kicked off a chain of events that would catch her own killer. I had to go to court a bunch of times too since I was basically the case's star witness and it was so freaky seeing that guy looking at me when I talked to the prosecutor. He literally killed a girl with his own hands and there he was, giving me death stares. Like I said, I've seen some wild stuff working pizza delivery, but only one thing that gave me nightmares. That guy's eyes. When I lived in the city, going to Target was a daily thing. One day I had to go find some pants to wear for a party. 
so I went to Target to see what they had and if I could find anything I liked. I noticed this guy walked in behind me and every time I turned around, he happened to be there. So I thought it was just a coincidence since we would always end up on the same aisle. I walked over to the makeup to look for some new foundation because mine was gone and I just happened to turn around and he was standing right there. So at that point, I knew something was up. He wasn't holding anything, just standing around trying not to make eye contact with me every time I would look at him. I walked to the checkout because I wasn't feeling comfortable anymore. I had this gut feeling that if I stayed in the store, something would end up happening. He then followed me to the checkout line. Nothing was in his hands, so he had nothing to pay for. He just stood there looking around. He was acting like I couldn't see him or even feel him looking at me. It was as if he was trying to stare into my soul. I paid and grabbed my stuff, but instead of walking out of the store, since I didn't want him to follow me out to my car, I instead walked over to the other end of the store to use the bathroom. He didn't follow me to begin with, but when I walked out of the bathroom, he was standing right there in the men's section, looking at underwear and socks. Again, not holding a single thing. So I decided to walk around the store some more, just to see if he would follow me again. And he did. So I found the manager and pulled him to the side, and whispered to him that an older man had been following me around the store the whole time I was there, and that I've been walking around since I checked out, just trying to lose him. The manager told me that there have been prior kidnapping attempts related to sex trafficking, and something like this happened a couple of months ago. He told me that I was smart to stay in the store. He then called the police, and the guy left the store before they showed up. If you ever have a gut feeling, you should listen to it, because that day could have ended a whole lot worse for me. A little background. Around November of 2019, I was running to a Target for some cupcake decorating supplies before meeting my aunt and cousin for lunch later that day at a relatively nice restaurant. With this being the case, I was slightly dressed up. Nothing too fancy, but I did look slightly older. It was around 10 in the morning, and I was walking to my car from the Target. I typically park pretty far back in parking lots because I hate fighting for parking spots. Suddenly a truck pulls into a parking spot a little ways in front of me, and a man gets out. I freaked out as he started to walk up to me. He asked me if I was single, and then tells me that I'm the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. I tell him that I'm underage, and I have a boyfriend. I lied about that part, to which he replies that he would wait. This man had to be at least 40 years old, he then gets back into the truck and backs into a spot at the back of the parking lot. I was about halfway to my car at this point, but there was no way in hell I was going back to my car because I could tell that he was watching me. So I instead walk into a nearby frozen yogurt place. I was visibly shaken. I quickly grabbed a cup of yogurt and tried my best to look natural because this guy was looking at me through the window. I call my best friend who lives in the neighborhood, close to the shopping center, and he quickly said that he would be there soon. About 10 to 12 minutes later, my friend came and picked me up from the yogurt place. When we pulled out of the parking lot, the man in the truck started to follow us. I texted my aunt to tell her that I would be about 30 minutes late for lunch. My friend took a bunch of back roads in the area and drove through some confusing neighborhoods, and we eventually lost the truck. My friend is my absolute hero, and he took me back to my car in the parking lot. I was going to run some small errands before going to lunch, but that obviously didn't happen. This incident just occurred a few hours ago, and it's still making my head spin. Forgive me if it seems kind of lengthy, but an awful lot was said. I'm an 18-year-old female. My mother, sister, and I were shopping in our local Target. 
As we strolled around, I recognized a girl named Stacy, who's also 18. I used to go to school with her. For reference, I dropped out of high school in my senior year. So I haven't been in my old high school or even seen anyone from there for about a year now. I simply glanced at her and kept moving, doubting that she even recognized me. A few minutes later, I'm on the complete opposite side of the store when I see this girl again. Like last time, our eyes awkwardly met and I tried just to walk past her, but this time she actually said something. Hey, didn't we play tennis together? Stacy said with wide eyes and a painfully large smile. There was a girl standing next to her, but I didn't recognize her. I simply replied yes in response. I was never friends with this girl in school. In fact, I never talked to her or even liked her. That's when she introduced herself, as if I completely forgot who she was. She goes on to question if I still went to high school, to which I explain that I graduated a year early with online classes. The conversation started out normal. I thought we were simply catching up, due to the fact that I had been absent from school. I kept wanting to cut the conversation short, but Stacy kept prodding about what I was doing now, if I was in college, and what was college like, harmless questions. Then, the conversation took an unexpected twist. Stacy somehow weaseled the conversation into one about God and Christianity. For reference, I do consider myself to be a Christian, but not one of those hardcore ones who are constantly spewing Bible quotes at strangers. She asked me if I attend church, to which I respond with yes, and her smile grew even bigger. Her whole mantra about God sounded something like this. Back in my high school days, I was always partying and having fun, but it was all fake, and no one knew I was actually pretty sad. That's when I found this church that showed me God's way and his undying love. He accepted me, and he'll accept you too. Now I'm always happy, for I have God on my side. At this church, God truly appears before your very eyes. He cured me of all my physical and mental ailments, like when I messed up my knee playing tennis. The whole time Stacy spoke, there was just a robotic tone about it, as if her words were memorized, practiced, and rehearsed. There was almost no genuine emotion in her, just wide eyes, and her never-failing smile. Then her friend Ashley, who was in her late teens or early 20s, began her speech. Keep in mind, my mother and sister are just an aisle away, waiting on me. Ashley's speech went something like this. For a while in life, I suffered with depression and suicide. I was always faking being happy until I found this church. This church truly opened my eyes and my heart. I no longer feel dead inside. This is when she hinted that maybe I felt dead inside too, and the only way to recover from it was to look to God. Ashley also used the word zombie to describe this dead feeling, and that's when I began to really think that there was something wrong with these girls. Ashley continued, I don't think it's a mere coincidence that we ran into you. God led me to you. He wanted me to reveal to you the way. God put a vision in my mind of you opening a present, and that present is our Lord and Savior. She kept on ranting about how this was destiny and that God put Stacy and Ashley in my path to reveal himself to me. When Ashley mentioned depression and suicide, I couldn't help but believe her for a slight second. I have been struggling with depression for years, but I've kept it quiet. And with me being a believer in God, I was almost fooled into thinking that this was a sign from God telling me to finally open up and get help. But when Ashley began to ramble about her church, that foolish hope dissipated quickly. Then the two moved the conversation about their church. They kept stating that it was not just a normal church and that God himself in flesh and blood came to them at that church. They informed me that God came to them to heal all their miseries and grief. Ashley then pulled out a business card, which had the church's email, a Bible quote, and her personal phone number. Before the anticipated departure, they kept saying how cool I am, and that they were glad to have met me. 
Then we finally parted ways. I remember my legs being extremely weak as I walked away. That was when it clicked in my mind. Are they a part of some kind of cult? Their mannerisms and behavior seemed too scripted to be real. That's when my sister found me and answered my suspicions. Apparently, before I had to endure that 10 minute chat with Stacy and Ashley, my sister overheard the girls having the same conversation with someone else on the opposite side of the store. So this was all scripted and it was their way of luring and persuading strangers to join their church. I realize now how they do it too. To reel me into their discussion, they talked about my absence from school and my experience in college. To reel in the other girl they talked with, they started off by complimenting her outfit and inquiring about her artistic hobbies. I wonder how many people they ended up talking to and if they were just walking around the store hoping to find easy targets. I still have so many questions, and that's what bothers me the most about this. Being the somewhat religious person I am, their talk about God unnerved me. It's sort of humorous to think about it now, simply because I think crazy God lovers are comical, but I'm still bewildered. If you have any information about how cults operate and how they coax people into joining them, please let me know. Does this incident sound like cult members trying to spread their message? Or harmless teenage girls simply spreading their love of God? If you have any other questions about what occurred in my interaction with them, please ask. It's also possible that I will see Stacy again because she is attending my college next semester. Although Stacy and Ashley seemed harmless and just overly excited about God, I honestly just hope to never encounter them again. This happened to my best friend around two years ago, who I'll call Sarah for privacy reasons. We are both studying in the same city, only at different universities, so we're living in different parts of the city. One day, while Sarah was studying for her exams, she realized that there was no food in the fridge, so she decided to go out for a walk and do some grocery shopping. There was a fairly large and well-supplied supermarket close to her apartment complex, where she stopped by for some fruits, yogurt, and noodles. She spent around 15 minutes in the supermarket, only to be greeted by a complete stranger outside who started having a small talk with her. He acted like they knew each other, although Sarah is positive that she had never seen him before. Overall, my best friend is a very polite and tolerant person, but also very cautious of strangers. She described him as a short, overweight guy with a goatee and a wide, odd grin on his face. On the other hand, my best friend is tall and she seems like a girl you would not mess with. She noticed that his fingers were somehow twitching while he spoke, indicating that he was nervous. The guy was at least 35 years old and my best friend was 23 at the time. Immediately, she realized that something was wrong with this guy. First, he greeted her by saying he had spotted her in the area a few times and then proceeded to ask her on a coffee date at a nearby cafe. Sarah was just standing there speechless and politely declined him saying she wasn't interested. It made him really mad, so he kept insisting that she go with him. When she refused again, he angrily told her that they would see each other again soon, calling her by her real name. She was absolutely dumbfounded by this, wondering how on earth this creep had found out her real name. She had no clue who this guy was. He didn't seem like a university student at all, but rather a construction worker, judging by the clothes that he was wearing. A bunch of questions came to her mind. She was afraid that she may have been stalked by him, so she threatened to call the police if he didn't just give up on his advances and leave her alone. Obviously, my best friend wasn't in the least interested in this creep, but if you think her story ends here, then you're wrong. The next thing she did was part ways with him. He stood in the same spot for a moment, and then, as she said, hopped into his car and started following her for a few blocks down the street in a dark colored car with tinted windows. When Sarah realized this, she got even more scared, so she had to take some lesser known routes in order to get to her apartment complex safely. The sun was just starting to set at this point. After some shortcuts, she managed to arrive back safely before dark, but she was left feeling paranoid from the whole incident, wondering whether he knew where her apartment was. She never reported the incident to the police, although she vividly remembered his facial features and overall appearance. Fortunately, nothing ever happened after this, and she has not seen the guy since. I really hope it stays that way. 
my advice for everyone is to stay safe out there because sadly there are a lot of narcissistic people who just can't take no for an answer. So I just got back from the store and I've got to tell you about this experience I just had. It may not be as scary as some of the other encounters, but it still gives me the chills. Let me start this story off by saying that this morning I wasn't in the best of moods. I had to work the graveyard shift last night and I woke up after only 4 hours of sleep with my back absolutely killing me. I couldn't get back to sleep so I decided to run a few errands since I was now wide awake. I needed to get a haircut while I was out as well. My sister works at a salon that is right next to a Target. So after I got my sister to mow my scalp, for free by the way, I popped over to Target to grab a couple of items before heading home. So I'm just doing my thing and pushing my cart down the frozen food section, and I turned the corner to go into the next aisle. When I did, there was a middle-aged lady that was pushing her cart heading in the opposite direction. I nearly bumped into her but then stopped before our carts collided. She gave me a mean look and then said in a really mean tone, Excuse me! Now again, I have to say I wasn't in the best of moods, and I'm a short-tempered person as it is. So without thinking, I take a shot back at her and then said, Oh, shut up. You're fine. Call me an ass if you want. No one's perfect. But what happened next was just pure insanity. The lady then suddenly left her cart and then started to follow me. I noticed this about halfway down the aisle and I then turned around to ask her what her problem was. And then I kid you not, she rolled her eyes to the back of her head, pointed at me, and then screamed very loudly. And when I say screamed, I mean she was literally shrieking at the top of her lungs. It was like something right out of the exorcist. I hurried down the aisle to try and get away from this insane person but she started running after me. Needless to say, all of the bystanders immediately stopped what they were doing and then just stared at us. The lady kept screaming like a banshee at the top of her lungs while she chased me around the store. Well, I noped the hell out of there, ran out of the exit of the store, and I looked back into the store as I was heading for my car. The lady was standing just outside the now open automated sliding doors just staring at me. While she stood there, her mouth was hanging wide open and she was still just pointing at me. Her eyes were still rolled right into the back of her head, and all you could see were the wide of her eyes. She suddenly turned around, then quickly walked back into the store. I decided to pick up my stuff at Walmart that was just down the street instead. All I could think though the entire drive home was, what the hell was that? That was insane. So to the creepy screaming possibly possessed banshee lady, I mean perhaps I shouldn't have been so rude to you. But you still have more than one screw loose in your noggin, and you really need help. But anyways, I definitely hope to never encounter you in the future. So when I was 16 years old, I got my first job working at Target. Most of what I would do is just walk around the store tidying up and just stocking up shelves. Pretty easy job. One day I was stocking up food when a guy comes up to me to ask where a product was. I told him and I offered to show him where it was so I walked him over and then started to leave. He was like, hey wait! And assuming he needed more help I went back over to him and then he immediately started grilling me with questions. How old are you? What ethnicity are you? Where do you live? Do you always work here? And then to my dismay. When do you get off work today? He had a really creepy and unsettling smile, and he was vaguely cross-eyed, which in this weird situation just totally added to his creepy vibe. I just told him that I didn't know when I would get off work and deflected most of his other questions, and then walked away. A couple of days later, he appeared in the store yet again and found me. I was really scared when I saw him, and he asked me again when I get off work and what I was doing after work. Again, I said I didn't know and started to walk away again. But then he started following me and then started telling me that I was so beautiful, just like his wife. Yeah, it was getting weird and I was getting really uncomfortable. So I tried to find a coworker and try to talk to him to get him away from me or at least have someone else to witness his weirdness. 
Well, I couldn't find anyone, so I said that I had to go work at the cash register instead. That got him to go away, but not before he gave me the creepiest smile that I'd ever seen, and then said, I'll see you after work. I was pretty creeped out at that point, and Casey stalked me home after work or waited in the parking lot for me. I didn't want to tell my manager since, I mean, I had just started my job, and I didn't really want to make a big deal out of it. I know, pretty stupid decision, but luckily nothing happened after work. The guy stopped showing up, and I don't think I ever saw him again after that. I guess he just wanted to scare me, but still, it was pretty creepy nonetheless. I'm a short, medium-sized girl. One day around the time that I was eight months pregnant, I decided to make a trip out to Target to buy some things. I'm a very cautious person, constantly looking at my surroundings with mild paranoia, which was mostly inherited from my mom, who raised three kids all on her own, so she was always on guard. I got out of my new car, which I parked a little far from the store entrance for two reasons. I didn't want to get any dents from the other drivers, and I tried to get as much exercise as possible since I was pregnant. As I'm walking, I notice a huge red truck with three men inside of it with the windows down. I assumed that they were just waiting for someone inside the store, but something creeped up my neck when I then made eye contact with the driver. I quickly turned away and then immediately began to feel self-conscious. A small girl that was visibly pregnant, I suddenly felt so vulnerable. Up until that point, my pregnancy was pretty smooth and never really made me feel like a target. Once I finally got in the store, I started to calm down a bit more and feel a bit relaxed and went about my shopping. When I left the store though, I noticed that the same truck was still there. I put my bag in the trunk and got in my car as quickly as possible, then quickly turned it on and drove away. I noticed in my rear view mirror that the same truck was also taking off, with the same three men still inside of it. My heart sank. I had realized right then and there that they weren't waiting for anyone inside the store. I got into the lane that can only make a left turn, and they were in a lane that can only go straight a few cars behind me. I thought, great, we're not going in the same direction. I was just being paranoid. As I passed the light now turning, I see the red truck then switch the lane that I was in to turn left. I then sped up to catch the next light turning yellow to put as much distance between them and me. I drove a little faster than usual, but that's when I realized that even if I made it home, they could still follow me there and I would be going home to an empty house. So instead, I decided to drive past my street right to a shopping center that had a Starbucks. The drive through wraps around the building, so you're not going to be visible to the main road which I was driving in. I get into the drive through and I notice the red truck was going on the road that I just left. They drive past the Starbucks and I think, good. I'm in the clear now. As I'm still in the drive through I then see the truck pass by again in the opposite direction, almost as if they're looking for me. I wait in the drive through for all of the other cars to leave, and I decide to call my sister and tell her I'm heading to her place. I didn't want to go home alone, and my boyfriend wouldn't be home for several hours. As I'm driving to my sister's house, which is about 25 minutes away, my mind just begins to wonder if they had ever caught up to me or what could have happened if these men were following me. Any possible danger that could have happened to me or my baby made me so paranoid that I didn't even leave my house for the remainder of my pregnancy. By the time I got to my sister's, I was absolutely shaking over it. I had told my sister all of the details and everything that happened. I never did see the men again or their red truck, and I'd really like to keep it that way. I had a seasonal job at Target last year. Every year they bring in new people during the seasonal times to help with all of the chaos of this pending season. It's pretty standard, just about everyone was doing this. It just happened by chance that I was doing it at Target. I think it's actually funny, I don't think I've ever actually been to Target until that job. But anyway, it was actually a night shift position. I would come in and start working at around 4am and that was one of the crucial times to get stocked up on stuff for the big shopping rush that day. Now the way we did it, it was we would get a shipment off of a truck and all the supplies would go into the back. 
We did that as fast as possible so the truck driver could get on with his next stop. Those guys were always in a rush. And once we got the stuff in the back, it was up to our team to get it all organized and stocked. And that was all fine and dandy, pretty standard procedure. Now there was normally a good number of people who worked this shift with me, normally between four and five of us, with the manager somewhere else doing whatever else managers do, but here was the situation. The layout of the store was a little weird. We had so much room in the warehouse area for all the supplies, but sometimes it would be too much, like drastically overflowing. And we had this other room to put some of the stuff we just couldn't fit anywhere else. It was a weird situation because that overflow room was not very big. I think it used to be someone's office. I don't know what happened there and I don't really care either. That was the job. It was a true nightmare to organize the stuff in that overflow room. It was a really tight working space because it would normally be two people in there doing that and the rest of the team would be outside. This room was kind of secluded as well. It was just kind of out of the way and didn't make sense to be a storage spot. Again, not my decision, just what I was told to do. It was one of these early mornings that I had to work in that overflow room with a guy I didn't know that well. He never said very much and he looked a little sketchy. I'd actually seen him walk off of the premises a few times after getting a text message. It was really weird. It was never for very long either. It was like he got a text message and went outside to take a smoke break or something. No one ever said anything though, so he just continued to do it. Honestly, none of us really cared that much. I didn't mention we came in at four in the morning, right? Well, this one morning that we were working in the overflow room, something a little strange happened. He got a text message and went outside like usual. I asked him where he was going and he just said he'll be right back. He left before I could say anything else, but I noticed he dropped something as he went out. It fell on the floor and I went over to pick it up. I could tell you exactly what it was, but... It looked like a clear Ziploc bag of herbs. Honestly, they probably weren't herbs at all, but being really tired and overworked, I assumed he was a gardener and he was carrying his herbs around. I know. I know how stupid it sounds. I have a lot of friends that are really into gardening, and I guess I just assumed the best case scenario. When he came back, he seemed like he was in a rush. He was looking around frantically. I told him he dropped his herbs. I pointed to them on a table in the room, and that was when he got really aggressive with me. He asked me if I thought it was funny. And that was when it dawned on me that he wasn't walking around with lavender in his pocket all day. It also dawned on me that he was probably selling while he was working this shift. That would explain why he would randomly go outside every once in a while. He threatened to kill me if I said anything to anyone. And I was honestly scared to death. I didn't know what to do. Looking back, I probably should have told my manager and called the police right then, but I never really had to deal with anyone that was a criminal or anything of that sort. Of course, I didn't say anything to anyone, but now every time that I saw him, he gave me a weird look. We'll just call him David for anonymity's sake. And that wasn't his real name, but it'll work. Over the next two or three weeks, I started to observe David a little more closely I paid a lot more attention to what he was doing and what he was looking at and how he was behaving. And after that time, I realized a few things about him. Firstly, he was definitely a drug user himself. I couldn't tell you what, but my guess is that it was something pretty hardcore. He would talk to himself like a crazy guy once in a while, and other times he would just completely zone out like he was in a different planet. The other thing that I noticed about him was that he was very unstable. Sometimes, he would get really upset over very minor stuff. There was one time he screamed at the top of his lungs because his shoe was untied, and other ridiculous things like that. Now while all of this was going on, I was still living my life. I still went for runs at the local park, and I made YouTube videos in my free time, just for fun. I tried to forget about the whole situation with David. That was until I saw David at the park, where I always ran. He was sitting on the bench, staring at me dead on. I stopped mid-step. That was the scariest realization ever, because it meant that he was stalking me, and I didn't know what his intentions were. I didn't know how long he'd been doing it or why. I just knew that I was in danger. I kept running and played it off like I didn't notice him. But oh boy, how could I not? 
Then there was one morning where it all went down. I showed up a little earlier than usual. I was always on early bird and I just hated being late. I was there about an hour before my shift started, must have been about three or so. I was chilling in the parking lot listening to a podcast on my phone and that was when I noticed someone pull up behind me. I parked kind of far away from the store to not take up parking for the customers throughout the day. I just thought it was unusual for someone to park so close to me when there were spots everywhere else. My heart sank. The person behind me turned on their brights and that was when I knew it was David. My fight or flight kicked in. I turned my car off and sprinted to the store as fast as I possibly could. I knew the employee would be open and I would be able to get to safety there. David started driving after me, like trying to run me over. He probably would have gotten to me too, but there was the spot where it was a line of trees in the parking lot. I ran to the other side of the trees when I noticed that he was driving and he couldn't really do anything after that. I got inside and screamed that I needed help. Surprisingly enough, my manager was there. I explained the situation to her and we called the police. She locked the employee entrance and we waited until the police gave us the okay. Obviously, David had booked it. The cops couldn't find him either. He wasn't at his apartment. Apparently, he gave the wrong address when he applied to work there. I guess they don't check the seasonal workers very thoroughly at Target. Hopefully, they do now. And that was the story of how I almost got messed up working at Target last year, and if you're wondering, I don't plan on applying again this year. It was spring break of 2007, and I was home from college during what felt like the worst semester of my life. Classes were extra hard for me that year, and not to mention... I had just gone through my first major breakup, and as a 19-year-old, I was still learning how to deal with that. So spring break was just what I needed. And to make things even better, my family had a timeshare on a cabin that was located in the woods just past Oneonta in upstate New York. I knew that I needed a break from the pressure of the real world and needed to find some peace of mind so I asked my parents if I could spend a few days in the cabin, if it was available. And to my luck, it was. And to my surprise, my parents were totally fine with it. We planned it out meticulously so that they wouldn't be worried about me. I was going to stay from Monday through Thursday, so I would need four days worth of food and water just in case the plumbing from the well wasn't working. After gathering all my supplies, and packing my clothes. I hopped into my Subaru Outback and made my way to the cabin. It was about a four hour drive, but I just jammed out to some a day to remember and the time flew by. In no time at all, I was at the cabin and I began to bring my things inside. I checked the sink and the plumbing seemed to be working fine. After getting settled in, I made my way around the property and just enjoy taking in all the sights. To be honest, the first few days were just pure bliss. I couldn't think of anything I would have rather been doing. Nothing compared to the scenery of the hikes that I went on or the two fires that I had outside the first two nights I was there. It was great. I just listened to some music and let my mind wander. It wasn't until the third day that things began to get a little strange. It was Wednesday, and I decided to go on one last hike before calling it a day. I walked down to my usual trail which led to a small stream that I liked to take a break at and watch for a bit before heading back. And at first, everything was fine. However, on the walk back, I couldn't help but feel like I had a thousand sets of eyes on me like every movement I made was being watched. I tried to shake the feeling off, but it wouldn't go away. By the time I made it back to the cabin, the hair on my arms were standing straight up. I don't know what it was, but there was something wrong. Looking back on it, I wish I just decided to pack up and leave right then and there, but I decided to stay that last night. 
so I went inside the cabin and locked the door and proceeded to make sure the two windows were shut tightly as well. After a bit, I had managed to calm down and was about to fall asleep. That was when I heard it. It sounded like breathing coming from the other side of the cabin door, which was next to the couch that I had been laying on. I froze. I couldn't catch my breath as I tried to listen for more breathing noises. But what I was met with was far worse. A quick, scratchy noise began to come from the other side of the door, as if something was trying to dig its way through. Then it stopped. I waited for a moment, as still as I could be, and that's when I heard it again, only this time it was to the right of the door, directly in front of where I was facing. It was as if it knew right where I was positioned. The scratching persisted for about 30 minutes, though it felt like hours. I didn't get any sleep that night, and as soon as the sun was up, I grabbed everything that I brought with me and bolted to my car. As I was sitting in the driver's seat, I was horrified at the sight of deep claw marks in the lower part of the cabin. An animal was definitely trying to get in that night, and I never went back to that cabin again. I was only 10 the last time that my family had gone to our cabin for a vacation. We used to go every year, but after that time, we stopped, which I was glad about because something really strange happened the last time I was there. It was me, my older sister, my mother, and my father. They had all gone to sleep and I was restless. I mean, it was early and I was 10, so I didn't know what to do with myself. I end up making the foolish decision to sneak out and stare at the stars. We didn't get those kinds of sights in the city, so I snuck out of the cabin as quietly as I could and made my way to the fire pit. The fire had long been put out, but it was a good place to sit and overlook the field near the cabin and see the stars. As I sat there, I looked out into the field and at first I couldn't tell what I was seeing. It looked like something was moving in the tree line just beyond the field. It wasn't until it stepped out into the light that I realized it was a man and he appeared to be heading towards the woods on the other side of the field. As he made his way through the field, I could see more and more of what he was doing because of the moonlight. I noticed he was dragging something that looked heavy. My heart just about to stop, though when I noticed he stopped moving and turned in my direction, I wasn't sure that he saw me until I noticed he lifted his hand and I swear he waved. I was so scared, however, to my relief, he just kept on moving. I immediately went inside and didn't say anything about it to my parents. I didn't want to get in trouble for sneaking out. It wasn't until five years later, when we were all sitting outside of our home, enjoying some takeout by the pool, that I ended up bringing it up. I didn't think anything of it. We had just been talking about some scary things that happened to us. So, I thought it would be a good one to share, but the look on my dad's face told me that I had said something that really freaked him out. That was when he explained to me why we had never gone back to that cabin. Apparently, two weeks after we had left and gone home, my parents were questioned by the police considering a body that they found near our cabin just a few days after we had left. Apparently, upon searching the area, police found nine different bodies buried in the property. I will absolutely never forget what I saw that night or how lucky I am still to be here. I was so excited to be getting back to the cabin with my cousins. 
It had been a few years since I had been able to join them on their weekend hunting trips. But finally, our schedules lined up and my parents let me go with them. It was just me, my two cousins and their dad, my uncle. We made it to the cabin and began to unpack. The boys and I couldn't wait to get outside and run around the woods for a little while before it got dark. So, that's exactly what we did. We dropped our stuff off and immediately ran outside. We were out there for about two hours before my uncle called us in for dinner. When we got inside, he seemed a bit weird, but I didn't think anything of it. I just sat down and got ready for some dinner. That was when my uncle asked my older cousin if he remembered leaving the door open or anything like that. He seemed to think that a squirrel or some sort of animal had gotten in and had been rummaging through whatever they had left there. My cousin said no, and that was the end of that conversation. We didn't speak another word about it. We just enjoyed our pasta and talked about our plans for the next day. All through the meal though, I couldn't help but shake the feeling like something was looking at us. Again, I just brushed it off like it was nothing and finished eating. After a few hours, it was time for bed. My cousins and I got to stay in the living room of the cabin, on the pull-out couch and the reclining chair while my uncle slept in the room that was in the back of the cabin. It took a while because we didn't have a TV, but we eventually fell asleep. However, about an hour after finally passing out, I woke up to my younger cousin shaking me. When I asked him what he needed, he didn't move, but I noticed his eyes were locked onto the window. When I looked, I couldn't help but scream. Ah! On the other side of the window, I could see a full-grown man looking in at us. I yelled so loud that I startled everyone in the cabin awake. My older cousin and my uncle, it was so loud that even the man outside the window seemed shocked. My uncle came running out to ask me what happened. We explained everything and without a second question, my uncle grabbed his cell phone and called the local police. They said they would be at the cabin in about 10 minutes. So until then, we all went into my uncle's room where he had his hunting rifle. And that was where we waited until the police arrived. After about 20 minutes of searching the woods, they found a man who had been hiding out in the bushes about a mile away. When they found him, the police said that he had a knife on him that looked like a kitchen knife. It was one of the ones from the cabin. To this day, the only conclusion that we could come up with is that the man had been staying in the cabin without my uncle knowing, and when we showed up, he had to leave, but he left prepared to come back and take the cabin by force. I'm thankful every day that my little cousin managed to see the man before anything bad could have happened. I never had much of a family. Mom died with her folks having cut her off. Dad was in and out of psychiatric hospitals before he took his own life. The only living relative I was aware of was my paternal uncle. But one of the few dark secrets concerning my family that I actually knew was that my uncle blamed himself for my dad's death. As a result, he'd built himself a log cabin up in Maine and had been living in seclusion ever since. But since I only had a rough idea of where the cabin was, and even less of a desire to reach out to him, he was just as dead to me as my parents were. Because the truth is, I blamed him for my dad's death too. Having someone to direct my anger towards, someone to blame, it was the only thing that allowed me a measure of peace after a terrible, miserable childhood. Against all odds, by the summer of 2015, I actually built something of a life for myself out here in Boston area. I was an assistant manager of a brewery pub, I had a small but nice apartment, I even got a couple of dates here and there. I was firmly in the process of putting my old life behind me and that felt better than I can possibly describe. Then came the letter that changed everything. It was from an attorney's office in Augusta, Maine, and as soon as I saw which state it was postmarked from, I had an inkling of the news that followed. Lo and behold, it was a letter stating that my uncle had died, and that this guy had been tasked with dividing my uncle's estate among his surviving relations. I'd always assumed he didn't have much money, and I was right about that, 
but that didn't mean I hadn't been allocated something in his last will and testament. Yet, irritatingly enough, I'd have to go all the way to Augusta to find out what it was. I gave the attorney's office a call, lied about being too busy to make the drive, and just asked them straight up what I'd been left in the will. So, imagine my curiosity when this guy tells me he has no idea what it is, that all he has is a key to a security deposit box located in an Augusta bank. He's been paid to ensure I open the box and understand the significance of the contents, nothing more, his only motivation being that his payment is locked inside the box too. It sounded like the plot of a bad movie, and only once the attorney had assured me that he was deadly serious did I actually start to believe it. Part of me wanted nothing to do with it, and told me it'd be nothing but picking at old wounds, dragging up a past I'd worked so hard to leave behind. But peace of mind doesn't pay the bills, and as greedy as it sounds, if there was money to be had, I wanted a piece of it. So I took a half day one Friday in mid-July the 17th, or the 19th I think it was, and I began the five and a half hour round trip to Augusta up in Maine. It's a pretty nice drive in the summertime, and the views quiet and the growing feelings of dread for as long as they were able to. But as I pulled up outside the quaint, homely offices of the law firm, Stevens and Day, I felt like I was on the verge of a miniature panic attack. I'd gotten it into my head somehow that all I was going to get was a letter telling me some awful truth about my family that had ruined all the progress I'd made over the past four or five years. So, you can only imagine my trepidation as I meet with the attorney and drive over to Bangor Savings Bank to unlock the box with him. I was actually clammy with nerves by the time the bank manager ushered us into the room housing the deposit boxes, and when I cracked it open to reveal nothing but a wad of cash in a single letter, I thought my worst fears were confirmed. The attorney took the money, but when it came to me opening the letter, I was obviously hesitant. It reached the point where the guy asked me if I was actually going to read it, or if I wanted some time alone, when I hit him with what I thought was a pretty unusual request. I wanted him to read the letter for me, then summarize it as clinically and coldly as possible. I knew I wouldn't be able to bring myself to read it for a long, long time, yet at the same time, I had to know what it said. He was blood, and as much as I hated him, I knew that honoring his final message was at a minimum the right thing to do. I watched the attorney's face the whole time as he unsealed the envelope, took out the letter and began reading. He briefly scanned the contents before a look of puzzlement came over his face, and sensing my impatience, he just showed me what was written. It wasn't some long-winded apology or explanation. It wasn't a goodbye or a dying request. All what was written were a set of numbers that I figured were coordinates and three scrawled words. Burn it all. When the attorney asked me what the significance of the coordinates were, I didn't have an answer for him. But all it took was a quick Google search to work out that they pointed to a seemingly random spot in the Debskonig Lakes wilderness area. I wasn't certain, but I was 90% sure that this was the location of his cabin, but whatever he wanted me to burn was a complete mystery to me. In the space of about 10 minutes, I went from wanting nothing more to do with such a grim situation to being consumed with morbid curiosity. My imagination went into overdrive, and I theorized on all the dangerously illegal or disgustingly immoral things he might have been up to out there. I just had to know more, because if he'd left some terrible, shameful legacy behind, you could bet I wanted to destroy it. The ride back to the Stevenson Day gave me an opportunity to politely grill the attorney on my uncle's death. I figured if he'd fallen ill or died at home, then someone must have seen the inside of his cabin. But according to the attorney, my uncle had driven himself to the hospital about a week before he died and had made the deposit box arrangement with him months before. So for all intents and purposes, the only person that had ever seen the inside of that log cabin was my uncle. Before I left the guy's office, I asked him his advice, and I'll never forget what he said. Well, as my grandpa used to say, sometimes things bury you if you don't bury them first. 
and he was right. I couldn't lose any more sleep over this nonsense. It almost killed me once before, and there was no way I was going to let that happen again. It was clear what needed to be done. I'd drive out to that cabin, do my uncle one last favor, and burn whatever horrible truth it contained to ashes. I planned to check into a nearby hotel, then set out at first light the next morning after eight hours of sleep. But eight hours sleep turned to be rather ambitious. When the clock on the motel wall ticked over to 2 a.m., I figured a better use of my time would be to scour Google Maps for the best route out to the cabin. Then, by the time the first slivers of blue dawn began to creep onto the horizon, I was packed up and ready to go. I didn't figure I'd need much, just a jerry can of gas and a box of matches, and those were easily procured. Then once I had one of those extra-large gas station coffees in my drinks holster, I was just about ready for the three-hour drive out to the lakes. The entire drive, I had those three words just echoing around my skull. Burn it all. I've never been so fully consumed with curiosity in all my life. It was an ache. Like that feeling when you hold your breath for too long and just need to let it all out. I had to know how my uncle had been living for the past 30 years and what it was he wanted me to burn. But to explore that cabin would be to risk my sanity when I could just burn the thing to the ground and walk away and go on living. I tried so hard to make up my mind, but the truth is, I didn't know what I was going to do until I was face to face with the old rotten cabin face to face with the truth. When I was almost certain that I was within walking distance of the letter's coordinates, I parked my car up in an old lot near a trailhead, then headed northwest towards what I assumed was going to be the cabin. But about a half hour or so into my hike, I began to notice something rather unusual about the area's flora, and it wasn't long before one particular sight stopped me dead in my tracks. There, lying in the dirt in front of me, was would look like a mix between a pile of beef mints and a brain. At first glance, I really did think it was living, or at least once living flesh. The shade and texture of it was almost identical to meat, but I soon realized that what I was looking at was actually a kind of fungus. I later discovered it to be Gyrimitra escalenta, or more commonly, brain fungus. And although it can be highly poisonous, it's not an uncommon sight in northeastern forests. However, what was uncommon was the frequency with which I sighted the distinct-looking fungus around the woods. And those weren't the only weird mushrooms I found out there, and the next variety I saw was even creepier than the last. While the brain fungus was just kind of gross-looking, I mistook the devil's tooth mushrooms for chunks of bloody human tissue. Go ahead and look those up, by the way. You'll see what I mean. Younger specimens basically bleed this bright red substance that I later discovered contains anticoagulant properties. In plain English, it looks like blood, and it can make you bleed easier. Creepy, right? But again, not nearly as creepy as just how many of the disgusting little things were dotted around the forest. They were everywhere. Sometimes two or three around the base of every tree and the closer I got to the coordinates, the more there seemed to be. I had this GPS app on my phone that was helping me keep track of where I was, and I didn't have to worry about the cell service cutting out because it worked offline too. But as it turned out, I didn't need any fancy equipment to find my way to the cabin. All I had to do was follow the mushrooms. I smelled the cabin before I saw it, it was this pungent, almost stewed meat smell, but with a sickly rotten taint to it, and by the time I actually laid eyes on the filthy wooden paneling through the trees, I almost had to cover my mouth and nose in order to push forward. The thing was covered in those brain fungus and devil tooth mushrooms, nestled in where the wood met the soil or where moisture and dank was able to cling under windowsills. I can't stress how utterly exhausted I was by this point either, it was almost noon, one of those cloudy summer days that just seals all the humidity in like a lid on a jar, and I'd been hiking with about two gallons of gasoline in my backpack, which let me tell you, was no easy feat. 
I just want to get things over with so I could set off back to my car. But a thought struck me as I was pulling a gas can from my backpack. I had no idea what the smell was. If it was due to some kind of flammable gas, maybe that's what my uncle meant when he told me to burn it all. Maybe it was primed to ignite and all I needed to do was toss a match on it. But if it was indeed flammable, the intensity of the fumes meant I'd risk blowing myself up if I just tossed on an open flame from arm's length. So that raised the question of just what was making that god-awful stench. But finding out meant looking into the cabin, something I'd promised myself I wouldn't do. But what harm could one little peak do? The journey out here had been depressing and confusing enough. Seeing how some miserable old hermit lived his life couldn't be so bad, could it? Of course not. So why was I so terrified to open that front door? Well, as it turns out, it's because I just couldn't compute what I'd see on the other side. The inside of the cabin was just as infested with fungus as the outside, and it was so humid in there that it felt like a freaking sauna. The first thing I saw as I attempted to cover my mouth and nose with the neck of my t-shirt was a huge pot on the stove. My uncle had been dead for about a week by this point, but before he died, he'd filled that pot with enough of whatever it was that it was only just beginning to boil down as it slowly simmered away. The opening to the pot was stuffed with rubber piping, arterial little tubes that seemed to run all over the cabin, each pumping out a kind of vapor that simply must have been the source of the stench. The place looked like a cross between a drug factory and some mad scientist's lab. There were sodden, moldy books lying on the floor, a blackboard with some indecipherable pictograms on it, and that was just about all I could get a glimpse of before my eyes started to water and I was eventually forced to retreat from the open door where I promptly vomited. Those fumes, they were just unbearable, like my head was spinning and I honestly thought that I might pass out for a moment. I have no idea what he was doing in there, all I know is that it had something to do with all those mushrooms. There were so many of them there that I thought I could almost hear them, moving or something. It was this repulsive, intestinal hum that made my skin crawl to listen to. After I collected myself, I wrapped my shirt around my face to create a kind of makeshift respirator, then set about emptying the contents of the gas can all over the outer wall of the cabin. Then, with a flick of a match, it all went up in flames, and I know it was just my ears playing tricks on me, that what I heard was just the sound of moisture escaping the soaked wood, but I'd have sworn I heard the screams of that fungus as it burned. When I finally drove back home, I was no more enlightened than I had been before. If anything, I only had more unanswerable questions, more to keep me up at night when that not knowing anxiety gets too much to bear. But still, I'm glad I burned that cabin down, that I didn't leave whatever darkness it contained to be stumbled on by somebody else. I thought I might hear about it in the news too, and for a day or two I wondered if I'd accidentally started some kind of forest fire. But no news ever came, not even so much as a peep. And I figured that maybe it wasn't just my uncle who wanted whatever was up there to stay secret, that it all runs deeper than I could possibly imagine. But I try not to think about it anymore. Like I said, I've made something of a life for myself, even got a long-term girlfriend who I've been talking about marriage and kids with, and I'll be darned if I do anything to mess that up. And if you're ever out near the Debsconic Lakes, keep an eye out for those mushrooms, because if you start seeing a little too many of them, it might be better for you if you went back the way you came. I want to start out by saying that I'm a 25-year-old male, average but broad build, and I'm somewhat taller at 6 foot 1, so not what you'd usually consider an easy target or victim. I'm an avid outdoorsman, I love being in the middle of the woods, either with friends or alone. There's a certain peace I find when I'm sitting alone by a stream with nothing but nature all around me. I specifically love hiking, 
and I usually start hiking in the spring. My favorite spot to hike locally is in a small town in southwest Ohio. This is normally a very peaceful, quiet, and relaxing place. Usually you'll run into a couple of other hikers or families swimming in the creek nearby, or just a few animals along your trail. This day, however, well, it turned out to be entirely different. It started off like every other hiking trip. I grabbed my pocket knife and water bottle and headed toward my spot. Once I arrived, I picked my favorite trail and started down the loop. It was a windy day in mid-spring, and I had been hiking for about half an hour when I then heard what sounded like a woman screaming for help in the distance. I paused momentarily at the bottom of a small incline, listening closely when I heard the scream yet again. At this time, I ran up the incline to see if there was someone injured nearby who maybe needed help. But when I reached the top of the small hill, my stomach wrenched, and I got the feeling that I should just go on about my business. So following my instincts, I did just that. After that, I stopped a ways up ahead and listened again. I hadn't heard the noise in a while, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't hear it again. The wind blew once more, and the noise came back as the trees swayed back and forth. I decided that the noise was from the trees and just kept on my trail. As I tried to shake the eerie sick feeling in my stomach, I rounded a bend in the trail and as I got to the clearing around the brush, I saw a man on his hands and knees on the ground with his face in the dirt. The man had a dog with him, and he was wearing a backpack. I figured that he had dropped something and was looking for it, so I just kept heading his way down the trail. As I drew closer, the man looked up at me and stood up from the ground. He was a larger guy, probably about six foot four if I had to guess. Pretty stocky build. His face looked like that of a drug user. He blocked my path. I stopped about 10 feet from him, standing facing him, maintaining eye contact and distance. He had asked me if I ever smelled these flowers, as he pointed to them on the ground. I then said, No, I haven't, as friendly as I could at the time. He then looked at me and said, Every spring, I have to get down on my hands and knees and smell these flowers. They're just nothing like you'll ever smell. I kind of just gave a, hmm, that's cool. He paused for a few seconds, and I could tell he was sizing me up. After his pause, he said, Yeah, you should smell them sometime. And he paused again, halfway motioning for me to get down and smell these flowers. Fuck that. I said, Yeah, maybe I will some other time. And he then gave me a look of subtle frustration, giving another long pause. I broke the silence by telling him that he has a really pretty dog. Yeah, she's a really good girl, he said. At which point then, I decided I had enough of this interaction, and I said, Alright, well, I'm gonna keep on my way then. The man paused again, and he just told me to take care, and then turned to keep going down the opposite direction of me. I started walking again, and after about five seconds, I peered over my shoulder just to make sure that he wasn't following me. But it was gone. He had completely vanished from the trail in just a couple of seconds. You'd think I would be kind of relieved to be away from him, but not knowing where he was really put me on high alert. I decided to try and enjoy the rest of my hike and went down this trail that I had always seen but never explored. The trail then went about a quarter mile through a field with trees on each side of the trail. Then at a sign with a map, split off into three mini trails that all led to backpacker campsites. As I went down the trail, I stopped for a second to use the bathroom and then check over my shoulder again. Nothing. I made it to the sign at the split and my stomach wrenched again, telling me not to go down that trail anymore, to turn back. So I did. I turned back and I started back down the trail to the main loop. I pulled my knife from my pocket and had it ready in my hand. I was about halfway back to the main loop when I then saw the man yet again in the distance. He had doubled back and was now walking straight towards me again. I've went over this in my head a hundred times and it just didn't logically make sense for him to turn around because it was only about a quarter of the way through his end of the loop. I was about three quarters of my way through the loop since we were heading opposite directions. He walked toward me, a lump forming in my throat and my stomach still turning. As he passed me, he had a look of annoyance on his face, 
He then saw my hand with my knife in it and just said once more, Take care. And just kept walking past me with his dog. Luckily, that was my last encounter with him and the noises I heard. I'm pretty positive there was no woman at all. I don't really know if he was truly a person or some kind of creature imitating a person. But I don't really care. I think those screams were actually a lure that luckily I didn't fall for. As for the rest of my trip, I hurried quickly out of those woods that day. I do still hike there, and I do still go on that trail, but I now won't do it without my pistol on my hip. I think he planned to trick me into smelling the flowers so he could avoid a fight and then hit me while I was down. God only knows what he would have done. I think because I was armed and I followed my instincts is why I came out of those woods that day. Maybe it doesn't sound so bad in this retelling of my story, but I know what I felt that day. No matter what your gender or size is, you can be a victim if you let yourself be. Always follow your instincts, always be aware of your surroundings, and always be prepared to protect yourself, especially if you're alone in the woods. I'm your typical 21-year-old American girl. I grew up in the suburbs and had a pretty nice upbringing. Unfortunately, I had been a total party girl up until the time I turned 20. That was when I started getting my stuff together. I nearly died of alcohol poisoning one night and despite being surrounded by some of my friends, nobody even bothered to help me. Even when it was obvious that something was wrong, I'm not going to lie to you, I was a really crummy person when I was younger. One of the things I remember doing with my friends was teasing a really unpopular kid. I get asked out by a fair amount of guys and I'm not the ugliest girl in the world. My friends and I all had an Algebra 2 class towards the end of high school and one of the boys in it always seemed to be checking me out. I really regret being mean and teasing him because he was honestly a pretty nice kid, just kind of socially awkward and completely lacking in any sense of fashion or style. One day after class, my friends and I were talking about a party for that weekend. He must have been listening in on our conversation because he came up to me and asked if I needed someone to go to the party with. I don't really know what he was expecting, but I went with it on a whim. I told him that I really needed a nice guy to go with me so people would think I have a boyfriend. He agreed to go with me and said that he would pick me up before the party. We exchanged phone numbers and that was that. My friends and I were already plotting on how we were going to embarrass him on the night of the party. I told him that it was a professional party. He told me that he had to go out and buy a tuxedo then. Me, being the horrible person I was back then, totally agreed. He picked me up in his mom's car before the party on Friday night. He even brought me flowers. It was at that point that I started to feel guilty and kind of wanted to abandon the whole thing. I couldn't do it though. My friends would have been really mad at me. They got two giant tubs of mayonnaise that they were going to pour on top of him. It was my job to have him stand for a picture and get him in the right position. Then, I will tell them that I had to go to the bathroom real quick and for him to stay in place, and that's when my friends were going to pour the mayonnaise on him. Again, I regret that whole role I played in this whole thing. I even felt guilty at the moment when I walked away, and I actually went to the bathroom. I didn't want to watch it happen. From what I heard, he started crying and went back to his car and drove home immediately. I thought that would have sent some kind of a signal that I really wasn't interested in dating him. Well, he didn't quite get that signal, because he still kept trying to talk to me and go out on another date. He even tried asking me where I went that night and it made me feel even worse than I already did because he didn't even realize that I was in on the joke. Like he thinks he randomly got mayonnaised. As guilty as I felt, I just tried to ignore him and hope the problem would go away on its own. We only had another month or so of algebra and it was every other day, so I figured the number of times I had to see him were limited. Well, he never actually got the hint. He found me on Facebook and messaged me on there. He somehow found my phone number, which I still don't quite understand how he did it either. Suffice to know that he still regularly made an attempt to date me for a very long time. I tell you this story not for fun or to brag, but because this guy, Donald was his name, continued his interest in me for six years. 
Still, even to this very day, we've been out of high school for years now and he still messages me or reaches out in some way every few weeks. After I started getting my life together, I tried explaining to him that I wasn't interested in him, but he never really got the message. I work a night shift job now, at a gas station on the edge of town. For the most part, we only really ever got truckers and the occasional traveler. Anything else is pretty rare, but sometimes on certain nights, around 3 o'clock in the morning, Donald will show up, and he's not looking to get gas, he's looking to get me. It's only happened three times now, but they were honestly pretty horrifying and I nearly called the police the last time. I think I will if he shows up again. The first time he showed up where I worked, he tried pretending like it was a coincidence. Like, oh hey, I didn't know you worked here, I was just buying one candy bar at a gas station at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, the usual. That night was really weird. The second time he came by, he told me that it was a long drive from his house to the gas station, but he said that it was worth it because the candy bars at this gas station were the best. Bear in mind, this guy was buying plain Hershey milk chocolate candy bars every time he came in, and not in bulk either, literally just one every single time he came in. Like, could you get any weirder? This last time that he came though, that was the time that really freaked me out. He's a lot rougher now that he's been out of high school. I think he works at some kind of manual labor job, or maybe he's just a dirty person. He always looks really disheveled when he comes in. And he walked into the gas station, bought his usual chocolate bar, but instead of leaving, he just stood there. I was standing at the cash register, just kind of awkwardly waiting for him to go, but I handed him back his change and receipt and just watched him stand there and stare at me like dead on staring me in the eye. I felt extremely uncomfortable and didn't know exactly how to end the social interaction. I asked him if he needed anything else, but he just said no and then continued staring at me. And that was when he reached over the counter and tried holding my hand. I could tell by the look on his face that he had some sort of intimate intentions in his mind, something devious. As freaked out as I was, I pulled my hand back as fast as I could and told him that he had to go. Why are you going to be like that? I love chasing you, but you got to give in one day, he said to me. That was when I told him that I was not interested in him at all and the only reason I went on a date with him was because I was in on the joke to pour the mayonnaise on him. I told him that I wouldn't date him if he was the last guy on earth and that I would never be interested in him. I saw his facial expression go from nefarious to angry. He knocked a bunch of gum off of the gum rack before storming out. Before he walked out the door though, he stopped and looked me right in the eye and said, I'll have you one day, you little pretty princess. And then he left. I had no idea how to respond. I don't even know what to do about the situation. He's not really doing anything illegal, I don't think, other than knocking things over. If I see him again, though, I might have to call the police. If this isn't stalking, then it comes pretty darn close. And the part that kills me about the whole thing is that I just want to put that phase of my life behind me. I don't want to think about being popular or partying or being mean to kids like him. I just want to save up some money, get my life together, and maybe find a good boyfriend, but... Yeah, that's my ongoing situation with a very creepy guy I played a prank on from high school, and looking back, I never should have gone along with it. I should have followed my intuition and done the right thing. Instead, I guess I have to pay my dues for what I have done in some way. Maybe this is some weird form of justice. I work at a regional grocery store. I'm a 26-year-old female. I graduated from college with a master's degree in psychology and still couldn't find a job. Due to family circumstances, I wasn't able to get my PhD, which was basically the bare minimum to land any decent paying job. So, I was a little stuck. I even had a hard time finding a regular job. I had applied to a bunch of lower positions, but I kept getting rejected because I was overqualified. Over and over again, people told me that I would get too bored on the job, and so they wouldn't hire me. This made me livid. 
After a certain point, my student loan payments were due and I really needed the money. I had to ask my cousin's friend for a job. He was the manager at this regional grocery store. Literally the only position they had available was stocking shelves on night shift. I couldn't believe myself. I was so ashamed. I felt like I'd wasted years of my life and thousands of dollars in debt just to get a job anyone could do. But either way, the job itself wasn't all that bad. I was allowed to listen to my earbuds while I worked. This meant I could turn on my favorite podcast while working. My favorite murder, if you're wondering. I must have worked there for about a year before the big change came. Previously, the store closed down at 12 in the morning, but for whatever reason, that policy got changed and it became a 24-hour store with the exception of holidays and Sunday nights. It really sucked. What used to be my podcast and stock the shelves time kept getting interrupted by stupid customers asking where things were. That was fine. I didn't mind helping people out. I worked there after all. But they would literally ask me where the most obvious grocery items were. So many times I couldn't help but think, are you literally blind or stupid? But then there was one night when a very strange man came up to me. He had really buggish eyes. Entire body was round and he had the longest nose hair I'd ever seen on a human being. It was like he took the hair right off of his head and glued it into his nose. I was down on my knees stocking the bottom shelf with pickles when he touched my hair. I had my hair in a ponytail that night and he lightly caressed the part of it that was touching my back. I jerked back and asked, excuse me? He tried playing it off like he had arthritis, but I knew that he was just being a creep. I asked him what he wanted. He stood there for a second. He seemed to be thinking of what to say, but only one word came out of his mouth. You. He walked up closer to me and then started to smell my shoulder. It felt so weird and I don't think I could have been more creeped out. I told him that if he doesn't need any help finding any items, then I had work I had to be doing. But he kept standing there. He started smiling real wide and then hugged me. It's okay, darling. I'm going to take care of you. At this point, I was screaming inside of my own head. This freak was crossing a million different lines. I pushed him off of me and ran to get my manager, who was a larger guy. He'd have no problem fighting this creep if it came to it. The creepy guy followed me as I went too. The nerve on this guy. When he saw my manager down the aisle, he must have had second thoughts because he turned around and started running away. I explained to my manager everything that had happened and he said he'd take care of it if that guy came back again. And that creep was smart because he waited a couple of weeks before he did come back. He waited long enough that the incident would not be on the tip of anyone's mind. I wasn't expecting him and neither was my manager. I was standing there stocking a shelf like I always did and all of a sudden I felt someone tugging my hair. They tugged really hard and it really hurt my neck. They totally overpowered me and started dragging me across the floor. At this point, I hadn't even realized who it was until I looked up to see that man. He must have dragged me a solid 30 feet to the exit before someone saw what was going on. It wasn't my manager, but it was another one of the girls who worked with me. She started screaming like a banshee and running at him, and for one reason or another, he decided to run away again. I was beyond relieved. I couldn't believe that he was just going to walk up to me and start dragging me out of the store by my hair. What kind of psycho does that? It was all just truly horrifying. This was finally the incident that convinced the store owner that we had to have security if we were going to be open at night. We had a security guard somewhere on the premises after that and I felt a lot safer. I'm still looking for a job in psychology and I really hope I can get one soon. I felt like I really needed a break after having gone through all of this. I work the overnight shift for a small organization for executive protection agents. Let's call the organization Black Tie Protection for the sake of this story. We're all ex-military police officers or highway patrolmen. In total, there are about six of us full-time and also a handful of part-timers. 
Essentially, we worked for a large-scale manufacturing company, but moreover, were personal armed guards for the owner and his family. They are a wealthy family in the small community, and with that, there become some troubles every once in a while, and that's where we step in. We ran 12-hour shifts, two guards per shift. My normal partner's name was Austin, but we all used his call sign, Coma. I know that seems weird, but long story short, this tough son of a bitch took a sniper round right in the helmet in his early service days and stood right back up to finish the fight, only to pass out after the fighting had finished, and he was actually in a coma for weeks before coming to again. Needless to say, he's a good partner to have. Our normal shift consisted of one of us walking the empty building at night, while the other sits at the guard station next to the owner's huge house watching the property, as well as the video camera feeds. The first of the two stories happened about a year after I started. People say that things happen when you least expect it, and that's exactly what happened. We had been doing our normal rounds and joking back and forth over the radio when I received a strange call over our secured radios. There was a slurred deep voice, can anyone hear me? I clicked the radio with the response. Coma? Is that you messing with me? He answered back quickly that it wasn't him. Then he said to whoever's on the line that it's a secure channel. After a few moments of silence, there was yet another strange call. It was the slurred deep voice again. Okay, good. You can hear me. I need you to help the person in the old house. I can't control myself for much longer. Then the radio goes silent. I immediately got back to the guard station, and both Coma and I tried multiple times to get whoever was on the radio to answer again, but there was no response. After a brief moment, the only old house we knew was the house that the owner had grown up in, and it wasn't that far off the property, and he keeps it out of nostalgia. We decided to go check it out. We got geared up and we jumped into the truck, then drove over to the old property. Now, this isn't a rundown house by any means. It was a nice two-story house. It had a really big pool in the backyard, and it was very well kept. The first thing we noticed upon arriving was that the light that's usually left on in the upstairs room was off. There was an eerie stillness in the air. We made entry, and we started clearing the room one by one, and after what seemed like an hour of stress, we had finally cleared the entire house. Looking around once we regrouped, Confused Coma then said to me, Yeah, I think this was all just a prank. And just as we were about to leave, the radio cracked on again. Once again, the slurred deep voice. Oh no, it looks like you were too late. I guess it's a good thing no one uses the pool anymore. Then silence again. We rushed down and we all looked at the pool, but nothing. Getting frustrated and feeling played, we were just about to leave. When I had spotted the pool house door was a little cracked. Using hand signs, I gestured guard up and moved towards the pool house. Upon getting to the pool house building, we burst through the door, our guns drawn, to then find something that still haunts me to this day. There was a female, maybe 20 years old, and she was stabbed so many times it looked like her body was Swiss cheese. Upon finding her, I had rushed to her side while Coma held the position at the door. Now, I had combat medic experience, so I had tried to find a pulse, but I didn't find one. Upon laying her down to try CPR, I realized her head had almost been cut off. After gathering myself, I also realized there was a smile drawn in blood right on her face and the word almost written on her forehead. We called the police and we secured the scene the best we could. It took about two weeks, but we finally heard the sick person that had done this awful act was a known convict that had actually been released only days before. He had lured the poor girl into the house by claiming it was his. That drawn-on smile still haunts me to this day. The 
The scary encounter happened to me when I left my homeland of Australia. I didn't really have a choice. I had just gotten out of a very abusive two-year marriage, yet I still wasn't free from my ex-husband. It was a very painful choice to leave behind my family, as we were extremely close, as well as leaving my country, Australia. But I needed to make a change for my own future happiness. Here's a little background. I'm a fitness professional and an elite athlete. I decided to move to LA, the fitness capital of the world. I packed my whole life into two suitcases and I then set off to start a new life. I was filled with excitement and anxiety and fear of the unknown. I had nowhere to live, no job or family or friends. I was on my own. I touched down in LA, checked into my hotel and started to look for a place to live and a job. I found a great apartment one street back from Melrose Avenue. It was a great location as I didn't have a car, so basically I just walked everywhere. After a week of handing out my resumes, I had landed a great position as a head trainer at a 24-hour gym. I was so excited. The gym was only a 25-minute walk from my apartment. My shift was from 4 p.m. to midnight, which I loved. I got to train during the day, which was perfect. I had settled in beautifully. I had made some really great friends, and I had also met a really great guy. He was from Canada. Life was finally falling into place, and it felt great. Now, coming from Australia and being raised on property life was pretty drama-free. So, walking home from work in LA at midnight, I truly never gave it much thought. Don't get me wrong, I was always careful, but I was never really worried. What an idiot I was. On this particular night, I'd stayed late, as my coworker was running late for their shift. No big deal. I left the gym and I started my walk home around 1 a.m. Now, my walk home was mostly very well lit on the main drag. However, the street I lived on was extremely dark with lots of trees. My apartment was about 200 meters down after you went off the main drag. It was a beautiful night. As I was walking home, I had noticed a very large dark-skinned man standing at the bus stop. The bus stop was just before my street. This guy was about six foot tall and at least 300 pounds. A big guy. Now remember, I'm a fitness professional, so I know physiques and I noticed him right away. We made some eye contact and I instantly felt the hairs go up on my back of my neck and I felt panicked. The guy wasn't checking me out like, oh, she's cute. Oh no. I felt his intentions right there through that stare, and they were not good. I could feel my stomach turning and my heart was beating right out of my chest as if I had just finished the 100 meter Olympic final. As I walked right past him with a purposeful walk, I could feel his eyes boring into my soul. I didn't dare look at him again. I really didn't want any type of conversation with him or give him any opportunity to approach me. So I walked past him and with every step as I walked by, I could feel my pulse quickening. When I finally passed him, my fear only increased as I then realized he's now behind me and I can't see him. I'm a strong fit woman, five foot seven at 135 pounds, but I'm clearly no match for a big guy like him. As I turned onto my street, the terror was now full on reality as my street is pitch black. No street lights and lots of trees as I mentioned before. I was walking so fast now. I reached into my hip pouch and I pulled out my keys, placing them between my fingers and held on tightly. My heart was pounding in my ears. All of a sudden, I hear these really loud footsteps running up full speed behind me. I spun around to see this big huge guy standing right in front of me and I screamed out loud. He then grabbed me with both hands, clutching my clothes. I was still clutching my keys and I had punched him in the face as hard as I could. Right at about that time, I then saw a car driving down my street towards us. The car started to flash its lights and beep the horn. 
This sent the big guy scrambling off, and he ran away. As the car then pulled over, I jumped back away as the person in the car then rolled down the window. I was crying hysterically. The adrenaline was pumping, and I was just trying to make sense of what had just happened. The person then told me to get in the car, that they'll drive me home. They said that they worked out at my gym, and that they recognized me. They also showed me their membership and license. And they then said, Please get in the car, I just want to help you. That guy went into the car in the alleyway. There's actually two guys, and I don't think they're done messing with you. My mind was racing as I then got into his car. I was crying so hard as the realization then washed over me of what just happened and what could have happened. I know that night I had a very special angel watching over me. That experience opened my eyes as well as my awareness to all of my surroundings. When you feel something isn't right, trust your inner voice. I'm so very glad I did. That night is a night that I will never forget, and the sound of those heavy footsteps will forever be etched into my brain. I don't ever want to experience anything like that again. Stay safe, and stay alert. About a year ago, in my final semester in college, I worked at a Shaw's grocery store in Boston, Massachusetts. For those of you who don't know what Shaw's is, it's basically a grocery store that's mainly based in the Northeast. I didn't have a car yet, so I mainly requested for day shifts as I've always been skeptical of the night. It wasn't that I hated them, it was more so the fear of what could happen, especially to a petite 5'7 girl like me. However, sometimes I'd be given a closing shift, much to my annoyance, as I had a 7.45am class and we closed pretty late. Whenever I did have a closing shift, we'd end up closing at 10 and it's about an hour's bus ride back home. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of closing shifts knowing my situation. I was pissed, but whatever. It's a few hundred dollars added to my paycheck, so I couldn't argue with that. It was a Thursday night, and I had just finished stocking a few chips as we had just gotten an extra shipment. It was me, my manager, and another coworker running the register. It's about an hour before we close, and the store is pretty much dead except for a few customers. I finish putting the chips on the shelves and get ready to clock out. Before doing so, my manager had told me to go outside and bring the shopping carts that were in the parking lot to the store. Living in a decent sized city, it wasn't uncommon for careless people to leave their carts out in the open. As I'm grabbing a cart beside a car, a woman rolls down her window and says hello. With a friendly smile, I say hello back and asked if I could help her. In the car was a mom and what appeared to be her teenage daughter in the front seat. Right away, the mom seemed concerned, looking back and forth before telling me that they needed gas. I tell her there was a gas station just down the road, but she then interrupts me, asking if I could give her money for gas. She's explaining as to how she just came from another state and was in desperate need. Being a dirt poor college student, I barely made enough to pay for my own tuition. However, I didn't want to decline help to someone in need so I take out my wallet and hand her a $5 bill. She stares down at the money and then back at me as if she wanted more when she said that it wasn't enough. I told her I was sorry, and that was all I had. She then says in a more direct tone, if I could get into her car and go down to the gas station to help her get gas. As I was about to respond, that's when I noticed the teenage daughter had been staring at me the whole time. She's sitting in the seat, giving me this dead stare while licking her lips as if she were planning on something. That was my cue to get out of there as something wasn't right. 
Thankfully, my manager had come out and when he saw the car, it immediately pulled out of the parking lot and drove off. I remember running up to him and thanking him for noticing. He also knew something was wrong as he could definitely see the fear and panic of my face. My manager took a picture of the car and was able to identify the year and model of it. I worked at that Shaw's for a good year after that and never saw that car again.